Hello, everyone, and welcome to Broadcasts from Fiddler's Green, my weekly podcast about culture, politics, and whatnot. I'm your host, Dave, from the YouTube channel, The Distributist, and welcome, welcome, everyone. So today I want to talk about sensible centrism, or really what I want to talk about is Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter and the consequences of his management of Twitter, which is what everyone's been talking about over the last uh, several weeks. But I guess it's always difficult to know how to start with these things because there's so many different emotions. People want to, you know, I probably could have talked about Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter last week. That's when people were really talking about it. Unfortunately, I had other things I wanted to talk about then. So instead, you're getting it this week when the story is a little bit more developed and people have had a chance to react to it. No, I'm reacting to the reaction. It's undeniably a win it's undeniably a win and i i don't want to temper that even though as sort of the the negative internet gadfly that i am it's sort of my job to temper your enthusiasm and tell you not to flex on progressives it's my job to kind of dump a cold bucket of water on all of these things and sober us up but uh, no it is it is a win and I, i've been kind of before i've wanted to get my own take on it i was sort of carefully reading everyone else's. And and the one that stood out, I think, the most was Academic Agents, who directly addressed it. And he was echoing sentiments that, that Sargon of Akkad was also talking about in his in his podcast, about how we should reframe the narrative now that we have a victory. For for everyone out there, you know, who's watching and and they're constantly going on about how the right never wins or whenever whenever the right wins, neo reactionaries or myself say it's not really a victory, this is illusionary is illusionary. This is actually a victory. This is what a victory feels like. You can sense that the left is getting more quiet. The left people should know this by now. When the left the left cries when they win. So just because they're crying doesn't mean you've necessarily beaten them. When the left loses, it tends to get very quiet. And right now, the left has gotten a lot more quiet, a lot more quiet. In fact, it's sort of hard to see their usual antics unless you watch a channel that explicitly tries to highlight the antics of, uh, of, of people on TikTok, Zoomers who don't know any better. But for the most part, the usual suspects have gotten very quiet in the last two weeks, which means that they have lost. And as academic agent has put it, the right has sort of conquered a castle. The definition of a victory, quoting Garvin, of course, is a victory is anything that you can achieve that makes future victories, future um, advances in your own power more likely. And indeed, Twitter, Twitter is a victory. This Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter has disrupted the cathedral's ability to project a narrative consistently. It's disrupted the media's uh, sort of patron, 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 <laughs> patronage networks and their, 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 their favorite way to sort of align their stories and align their narrative. And just recently, it's given a new lease of life to a number of accounts people thought were banned. There's been this huge resuscitation, this mass resuscitation of all of these people who were taken off Twitter for, for really questionable reasons. And all of a sudden, the right wing feels like it's got new life in its sails or new wind in its sails. New life has been breathed into it and it feels the wind in its sails and it's looking forward to something brighter and it wants to know, well, what's next? Obviously, we can do so much more now that we're not banned off of Twitter. Uh, all these progressives are talking about going to Mastodon. L little do they know, little do they realize that for anyone on the right wing, uh, alternative tech doesn't work like that, right? Uh, the, the, these whole social media networks came about at, at a particular time in human development, at a particular time in the development of the internet. And because of that, it's... um. It's very, very hard to reconstruct them once they've been shattered. People aren't enthusiastic. Normies aren't enthusiastic to sign up to a new social media. And the fact that the majority of the people who don't care about anything are on the main ones, the loss of that makes it very, very hard to rebuild a narrative power base somewhere else. And you have kind of ridiculous spectacles like Taylor Lorenz constantly promoting her Substack uh, as as the the place where people can reach her. The new home for free speech, guys. Didn't you know that Substack is the new home of, of free speech, according to Taylor Lorenz? 
Uh, she was she was calling it a den of Nazis six months ago and was was trying to smear its reputation, but but now it's the now it's her refuge. It's and and you can see now how how even even the alternatives people glom onto in, in the wake of, of the previous uh, in the wake of the previous year's mass censorship, e- even their attacks on those things have weakened slightly, weakened noticeably. Okay, now now here comes the the cold bucket of water everyone was kind of uh, expecting me to deliver, not cold water necessarily, but just some, some perspective, right? It's like that scene from Ratatouille. Uh, you, you, you serve the meal and, and I, will, I will, it's all out of perspective. If you're all out of perspective, you serve the meal and I'll provide the perspective. Well, you know, Elon Musk has provided the victory and it seems like everyone's out of perspective. So allow me to provide some perspective here. The question isn't whether we've won. The question is, what is it we've won? What have we secured? Obviously, this is something that was very valuable for our enemies. But what good is it in our hands? Now, I'm going to start with a story. And I know I like meandering monologues. So you're stuck with me. I guess you're watching, right? It would be funny if if my sound was off. I I don't think it is. Otherwise, people would be typing Fs in the chat by now. But... But I, but I, lo- I love a meandering story, and I love something in real life that kind of sets the stage. So about two or three weeks ago, uh, my wife was really keen on playing the lottery. Now, the lottery is something that I hate with every bone in my body. And it's a true marker of class differentials between our two families. I say this all the time, but it, it just shows you how class is different than money. Because her family and my fun- my family have the same sort of dollar amount of money in the bank, more or less. But her family is distinctly lower class or lower middle class, and, and my family is distinctly upper middle class. It's a family of teachers, and her family is a family of sort of skilled craftsmen, so to speak. Uh, you know, her, her father was sort of career military. And the, 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 one of the big differences culturally is that in in the sort of the lower middle class, not America because they're Canadian, but in sort of the lo- lower middle class, it's acceptable to play the lottery. Whereas in the upper middle class, it's seen as sort of a a a, a marker of 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 being stupid because the the odds are so terrible, right? Um, so the so I said you no, know, then the jackpot was some ridiculous thing. Like to it was like it was basically like the uh, the 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 it was basically Alex Jones's uh, settlement. It was like two or three billion dollars, <laughs> uh, something ridiculously high. And uh, and so okay, sure, we'll buy a lottery ticket. And uh, just as that was happening, I was cashing out my uh, you know my Bitcoin uh, from the entropy chats you guys are giving me. And I noticed that it was a little bit less than what was actually the dollar amount that you chatted me, right? Because it was given to me in Bitcoin and there was a Bitcoin crash and now the money is worth, well, you know, I take it out promptly, but it was still worth significantly less. And I joked to my wife when she was buying this lottery ticket that, that if she won the $2 billion, uh, maybe what the the lottery the, the the was it the New Jersey lottery I don't know it was some state lottery maybe the state lottery would uh, would would simply you know I know all these governments are invested in in these these hedge funds maybe one of them was invested in Alameda so to to cover its financial losses the the winnings of the lottery would pay, be paid in a billion dollars of 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 like Bitcoin or even worse the FTTs like some worthless shit coin right. And you know what, what would you do with it? Like by the time what, by the time you got the billion dollars from when it was transferred for you, would you still have a billion dollars? And so there's there's this sort of a funny funny game you can play with this. Okay, you, you, the, the state owes you a billion or two billion dollars. What what could they possibly pay you in, that money in so that it would become almost more trouble than it was worth to actually get the value out of it? Obviously, if it comes to you in Bitcoin, you might lose thirty percent of that by the time you get it into dollars. If it comes to you in FTT, you're already broke. If it comes to you in various commodities, you have to sell those commodities. You have to get them into a currency that you can use. And you, know, you think of like the worst things like, okay, well, what about a billion dollars worth of turkeys on the day of Thanksgiving? Can you move it on time? You know, what, what is it? Oh, what? and finally, the worst possible way you get your payment. How about a, mil, how about a billion dollars of cow manure? 
right? People pay for cow manure. It's technically a way to exchange wealth, right? So, so imagine that. Imagine, you know, getting a, mil, a billion dollars of cow manure and, uh, you know, you have a billion dollars of wealth. Uh, people will buy it from you, but it's all, you know, cow manure. It's all shit. Uh, and, and so now you have to think really, really hard about how you're going to move all this cow manure and get it sold on the open market before it disintegrates into methane and, and, and this stinks up your entire property and you better act quickly. Uh, this is essentially what we've gotten in Twitter. It is a billion dollars or whatever, however you want to measure power. It is a significant amount of, of, of power, a significant amount of money in my example. But it's, it's, it's in this state where it's incredibly difficult to use. It's in, the, it's, 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 in, it's in the form of democracy. And democracy is shit. <laughs> I mean, it's even worse than getting it. It's, it's even worse than if you got the lottery paid to you in, in terms of horse manure or cow manure. It, it, it would be like getting the, the lottery paid to you in depleted uranium fuel rods. So not only do you have to sell these things uh, before like they deplete and lose their value, you have to sell them before it literally kills you. Because uh, sure, the rights conquered Twitter. That's undeniable. And that is a huge victory, mostly because we can take it away from the left and they lose the ability to forge their narrative control. But the problem is, is that now we have to figure out how to convert democracy into power. And furthermore, Twitter is an addictive drug. It literally hurts your psychology. It hurts your attention span. It hurts your intelligence. It hurts your focus. It hurts your community cohesion. Every time you use it, you lose something of yourself to it. And, you know, I should say, like, I'm, I'll confess here, you know, I got off Twitter for principled reasons. I got off on Twitter in the, in the winter of 2020, after January 11th, because I was so connected to this whole bread tube scene, all of these really creepy people started appearing in my DMs on Twitter, issuing kind of vague threats. You know, one of the more notable ones was that um, weirdo that used to blog under the name Faraday Speaks and now has di disappeared off the internet. And, you know, kind of like, oh, man, we've got you. You know, you, know, you have to work with us or, or the feds are going to think that you're involved in terrorism, all that bullshit, right? And, and, and the, the whole thing felt like, you know, I was getting, obviously I dismiss these people as the obvious trolls that they are. This, this is not a serious attack. These people are flexing and looking stupid doing it. But the, the sort of the aggression and the panic and the black pilling was causing me anxieties. Not only did I have Twitter decreasing my attention span, I also had it make, making me a less happy person. And this was noticeable. My, my, my wife reacted to it, right? We had a, I mean, I think my son was, what, like six months old only at that time. Um, oh, no, wait, that was, um, no, it would, she, it, would be, it would be a year and six, six months, pardon me. Um, the, uh, so the, the, it was just, it was time to get off Twitter. And as soon as I quit Twitter, my attention span starts to return. It's a huge boon. And I, I say, okay, well, I'm going to go to Telegram now. And of course, Telegram is basically like Twitter, uh, but it's less addictive. I guess that's the good thing about it. But it's actually worse in terms of quality because the, 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 the people who use it are, are more fringe. And it's impossible to control the quality of posting. There's bots everywhere. And it has very, very limited reach. It can't be used as a mechanism for publicity. So very, very slowly, I kind of got back on Twitter, mainly through the force of one person and one person alone. And that would be Alex Kashida, who has a wonderful podcast and a wonderful Substack called, uh, it's called Subversive, I believe. Uh, but I think her po I think her Substack is called Garden of Earthly Delights, which is a wonderful name for a Substack, if I do say so myself. And Alex Kashuda, she was an interviewer, a documenter of the distant right. And a lot of people she interviewed only had presences on Twitter. And I wanted to DM them and interface and network. So I had to create a phony account. And, you know, pretty soon I'm following people. And, and and the phony account gradually becomes real as as it becomes an address book for myself. And now this last week, when when Elon Musk sort of opened up Twitter, uh, the the last barrier went down, and and it seemed like okay, well, whatever. 
what I'll give it another six months. And and if I'm a frazzled attention deficit disorder waste by the end of those six months, I'll reevaluate and get off of it or I'll delete it from my phone or I'll, I'll create some barrier so I don't use it because you shouldn't be using Twitter in, unless you're using it for some kind of professional reason. Uh, but but it's it's odd because in, in using Twitter, you, you kind of... Coming back to Twitter culture after a long absence is interesting. It, it really is just the, 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 the demotic mind made manifest. It's all of these idiotic ideas that, that, that you think people have gotten beyond, and they're sort of still in full force. Like, it came up uh, against a lot of these rationalist Christians, these sort of young guys who are trying to do the normie conservative thing over again, uh, apparently blissfully unaware of any kind of, any of the dialogue that's gone on in the last five years. And you, know, you come across, uh, you know, normie conservatives, the usual fare, uh, they're still doing their thing. And it, it feels kind of like, you know, the, the land that time forgot. Um and of course, you know, the old people on the right who got banned are kind of coming back and trying to get their bearings. Um, and, and, and in all of this, the question is like, well, what, what can you really develop from this relationship? What is, what is, what is meaningful? Um, what, what can be done with Twitter? Uh, what most people seem to be thinking is that Twitter is going to be this giant microphone that it's going to amplify our voices to kind of drown out the mainstream media. Uh, this is not... Ba basically, I'll summarize this. They think they're going to go back to 2016. Right. And so let's, 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 cover, let's, let's briefly review what, what 2016 was for the right wing. Why, why did this... I, I, I could include 2015 to 2017 if you want to be specific. Why did this time frame uh, sort of for a moment, completely exposed the mainstream and caused them to run fleeing away from what seemed to be a, a resurgent right wing for the first time in, in half a century. Well, what, what, the, what, what happened was that the, the media had built a lot of their infrastructure and a lot of communication on these ostensibly free speech platforms. These are platforms that were run by people like Jack Dorsey, who genuinely wanted them to be free speech platforms. And their, their, their idea was that there would be a set of ground rules and they would be relatively open. And this is a place for, for, for ideas to kind of communicate. The, the internet is where bad ideas die, was the understanding. Of course, what was very, very apparent from 2015 onward was that the right wing could open up all sorts of modes of dialectic that were sort of off the reservation. Once you kind of question the assumptions behind the progressive liberal worldview, uh, you could ask questions that progressives had no answers for. You could enter into dialogues where they didn't, they didn't have a way to sound smart or a way to sound with it or a way to do anything other than to kind of curl up in a ball and claim that they're, claim, uh, pr pr present themselves as victims or to block people. And because of the asymmetry between what what the the mainstream progressives were doing, and 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 what sort of the newer activist class were doing, uh, they didn't see the danger coming, and they were totally blindsided by it. And then, starting in two thousand and eighteen, a little bit before that, maybe uh, they tightened the screws down, and they um, they they were able to kind of get back into control of the narrative. Starting by banning people, uh, but but largely by just sort of flooding the zone with counter narratives, flooding the zone with counter narratives like Black Lives Matter, like the Kavanaugh hearings, things that were really exciting and energized their base. And so you could you could uh, pay attention to the right wing dialogue over politics, over some boring thing like immigration and monetary policy, or you could get involved in, in the latest outrage and. And this sort of this sort of helped stop uh, stop the bleeding from the progressive movement a little bit. And I, I talked about this phenomenon a lot. There were sort of there was sort of the phenomenon of bread tube, and the phenomenon of bread tube was largely, I, I think, to stop the bleed that the progressives were were experiencing of young white men, and to get young Zoomers and to feel comfortable with a left that was obviously hegemonic 
and not in their interest. So for, for all of us on the distant right, it's very, very obvious that the left is the pawns of the establishment. And, and the Ber Bernie is sort of a fig leaf they hand out to the millennials, the promise of socialism or revolutionary capitalism. These are all illusions to, to, to keep the, the young people on side. They promise ever more radicalism and ever more insane uh, prescriptions on the culture war uh, with, the, with the hope that that sort of identity-based politics will stop them from asking deeper questions about neoliberalism and progressivism. And what it will mean to be a young person or, or a young person of European or Asian ancestry in this country after another 20 years of these policies. And why, why are things so much more bleak than they were in the 90s? And why is crime so much higher than it was in the 50s? And you know, all of these uncomfortable questions. And, and for a moment, uh, this was necessary. And the problem is, is that, the, the, that the, 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 the right learned the wrong lesson. The right learned that the right believe, and this is it's partially true, the right believed that they lost this battle because they all got banned. That's partially true. They also lost the battle because the left got smart. And they realized, like a lot of more powerful armies realize, uh, they, they don't actually have to fight battles to win the war. Uh, they, they, they don't actually have to, like, you know, this happens all the time with the people like Richard III fighting Saladin or the Confederate Army fighting the Union Army. Uh, that you have a smaller force that's very, very energetic and that's very, very good tactically going up against a much more strategically uh, fortified force, one that has a lot more money. And at some point in the war, the, the larger force realizes that it doesn't even, like, battles themselves aren't really necessary. And it can more or less just choke out the smaller party through attrition. And that is, it's really that attitude that the left has taken more than it is the the, the, the bannings that did it. The bannings were there to sort of, um, to sort of uh, immediately stop the, the near-term problems for the cathedral. And, and then get it slowly, slowly into a position where everyone on the media would be more or less on the same page. Okay, because because now all journalists know. There, there's been a changing of the guards at the New York Times. They know that when you have a problem with people like Jared Taylor or uh, Mike Cernovich or any, anyone, I don't know, Tucker Carlson, you, you don't invite them on the show for a dialogue. You don't go to Crossfire. You don't go to the McLaughlin group. No, no, what you do is you, you take a social science a social scientist and a bunch of reporters and, and you do a scare piece about how these guys are corrupting the youth and how they're responsible for some mass shooter because what they said, you know, filtered down through the interwebs and, and lodged in some mass shooter's brain. And of course, since most mass shooters are schizophrenics, uh, their, their entire worldview is a mismatch of different radical ideas that they've sewn together incoherently. Uh, the most recent one, um, the the sort of uh, the the gay the gay nightclub shooter, from what we can tell right now, and I'm speaking in early December, uh, it appears like like most shooters, he just took everything from everywhere. You know, he he took some stuff from the right, some stuff from the left. You know, his, his father was obviously very much against homosexuality, uh, and then he calls himself non-binary. It, 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 with a lot of the people who have deep mental problems, their ideology has no coherence, which is actually beneficial because it works into the progressive narrative. Sure enough, they posted something somewhere that looks right-wing, so then that becomes part of the narrative. They were a right-wing assassin. And so the the left knows th extensively throughout its institutions that their goal is to shut down discourse, to never platform the right in anything but the most controlled circumstances, ones where it's very, very obvious what the messaging is going to be. And, and they've solidified that over four years. The unbanning made that the solidification of that narrative possible in the short term. But now that everyone's on board, it's not going to undo that. And, and so what you have now is you have a lot of noisemakers on Twitter. And that's going to be useful. You can create a lot of noise. And you can create a lot of narrative power on Twitter. And progressive, and progressive journalists who use Twitter are going to have to contend with that. But at this point, they know better, not to, they know better than to try to engage with it. 
and you see the, the reemergence of, of these characters that are sort of blasts from the past. Just this week, and I know people want me to mention this, there was this whole meeting of Kanye West, uh, what was it? Kanye West, Milo Yiannopoulos, remember him, and Nick Fuentes. And, uh, you know, I don't really know much about Kanye West. I kind of intentionally try to ignore him because he's obviously an unwell person who's suffering from a manic phase of a bipolar disorder. It's very textbook that. And, you know, you could say that he's right about some things, wrong about others, but it's just not worth it to engage with this intellectually. Uh, I guess Milo is a little bit more interesting, but but I don't trust a word that Milo says because I think he's a, he's a fabulist and a narcissist. And I think that he does anything for clout. And I understand that he supposedly had a conversion to Catholicism, but quite frankly, I, I, given his past troubles with narcissism and and with and with sort of abusing the media spotlight, I would really rather that conversion of to Catholicism take place off screen, and, and certainly away from controversy controversies like the cluster F that happened with Trump and Kanye West. You know, fresh from all of these accusations of anti-Semitism. Three of the most controversial figures that get on a plane and sit down to a, to dinner with Donald Trump, completely hijacking the news cycle. I mean, we had a number of revelations about lockdowns and COVID this week that came out. Uh, people potentially floating more facts about its origins. Uh, all of a sudden, the media changes its, narr- changes its narrative on a dime to be against lockdowns. Lockdowns are now oppressive. Um but we didn't, you know, and we also have the mysterious excess deaths that no one wants to talk about, that that are continuously unexplained. That that now we have the power to force into the collective consciousness consciousness because of Twitter. But none of that gets talked about because uh, we've got this this meeting of these three toxic people with Donald Trump. Uh, I'm not saying that this is a psyop, but if I were in charge of psyops. Uh, with someone who did not want Trump to run for office, what I would do this week would look a lot like what Milo and Nick Fuentes and Kanye pulled off. Try to get as many people who are sort of radioactive to most moderates in a plane and bring them to Trump to make it look like there's a giant concerted effort. Uh, uh, There's a giant uh, meeting of minds, so to speak. And and then then afterwards, just in case there might be some political benefit to Trump, from from attracting sort of the crazier end of 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 Kanye West's fan bases or or the 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 cringe uh the, the cringe sort of fringes of of Milanopolis's Milanopolis's fan base or Nick Fuentes's fan base uh they decide to maybe start a third party uh, it's it's almost too perfect <laughs> it's almost i i can't I believe that is 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 real. It, it looks like something that you you you'd cook up if you wanted to try to take a, a bite out of Trump's prospects as as the likely uh, nominee for the Republicans and Victor in two thousand and twenty four. Not that this concerns me, because the nature of American elections has, has fundamentally changed as the last election has taught us. So you know we we can argue about whether it's even possible to elect Republicans anymore. What concerns me more is that uh, we have had the microphone uh, for, what, two weeks now? And we're still talking about how crazy certain personalities are on the right wing. Uh, And you can see sort of the mentality of of 2016 creep back. The the entire career of Nick Fuentes is based on this. Nick Fuentes, whose age always has to be prefaced by just... First, he was just 19, then he was just 20, and now he must be, what, just 24, just 25? I'm sure that when Nick Fuentes is 40, he'll be, it'll be, he's just 40. Uh, Maybe Zoomers aren't aware of the history of Nick Fuentes, but his entire shtick has this life cycle. He builds up this enormous head of steam on Twitter originally, but later, in places like D Live or I don't know, is he on Telegram? Probably, he gets an army of Zoomers together who are very dedicated and who troll the hell out of anyone who gets in his way. Uh, he starts controversies, and then he builds funding. He builds a huge clout for an event, 
and he he gets he gets conference positions and he gets uh packs together and he 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 shares the stage with Trump with former presidents and sitting congresswomen like Marjorie Taylor Greene and then he takes the cloud he's developed from this enormous head of steam and he shits all over it he just he just takes an he takes a huge dump on the entire project he he fed posts he he starts talking about uh, mustache man and mid-century germans and events that didn't did and didn't happen in 1944 and did or didn't happen in 1944 uh and then the whole thing crumbles and he's a pariah once more and he he used that moment of prominence just to secure more edgy clout and which i guess is what the people at 4chan or d live like because the cycle continues on again and sure enough in six months he'll start again with another stunt and it never leads anywhere other than to completely capsize the reputations of the people who he touches uh, this cycle has gone on for three or four times now at this stage and I, i'm wondering what ultimately comes of it other than a lot of ruined reputations I guess what happened is that we, we were able to successfully grip Charlie Kirk. That was it. And I'm not trying to go after Nick Fuentes. I guess I kind of am. But he, he really does embody the, the 2016 mentality to social media. Like, like, we have you because we have social media clout. The, the social media clout represents something that the cathedral, the mainstream media, the mainstream powers that be have to respond to. They believed that in 2015. They don't believe that now. And they will intentionally try to freeze the right out of any kind of dialogue or dialectic. And any interface that Nick Fuentes does get will be gotten from the right side of the aisle and will, if anything, probably proceed to the ultimate benefit of, of the powers that be because he will discredit other people in the process of pulling off this shtick where he constantly tries to prove his edgy credentials so that he can catch the next wave of cloud and controversy. Trump was able to manufacture controversy and then use that to pry his way into the media. The media was forced to cover him. The media is more disciplined now. The media has closed ranks. They're not falling for this stuff anymore. And so now that we're all unbanned, now that we have a castle on Twitter that is not completely hostile to right-wing ideas. Uh, we have less than we thought we did, I think. Just definitive, I mean, it's still, it's still power to a certain degree. It's still something that can be used. But, but it's, not something, it's not something that leads directly into the headlines, directly. And it's, it's less clear what demographic can be peeled off from the mainstream. It was very clear what demographics were peeling off of the Democratic mainstream in 2016. It's, it's very clear who you're talking to. Twitter really has only a few uses, and, or I should say discourse generally only has a few uses in, in this form. Uh, you, can, you can try to open up, you can try to convert, first of all, you can disrupt people. That's obvious. You can, you can create sort of massive hashtags that make whatever people are doing seem a lot less popular because it probably isn't very popular. You can kind of humiliate the Democrats. You can humiliate the mainstream media. Uh, you can probably expose certain facts about things, uh, certain viruses maybe, and the effectiveness or non-effectiveness of remedies or their possible origins. Uh, you, you, can, you can probably make that a lot more apparent than you could before. You can also try, you know, the second thing you can do is you can kind of, um, you, can, you can try to open up modes of dialogue. This was, I think, more or less how the right wing used the, the platform in 2016. They would create a huge amount of uh, controversy. And then the controversy would start discourse. It would start some kind of conversation. It would ask uncomfortable questions. And then in asking the conversation, you could sit down with somebody and, and hash it out. And that was very, very dangerous. And what, what made it dangerous was, I think, less so the initial explosion of controversy 
and more so the conversations and dialectics that came afterwards, because the left had completely lost their ability to communicate this stuff. Uh, they, they completely lost their ability to, to be convincing and to kind of hold the frame. And, and you know, the last thing I guess you could do is you could try to take these th these discourses and these that are happening on Twitter and then move them into a more real space. Move them either into private conversations or private relationships, or preferably move them onto a Rolodex that can eventually be used to build things either in more intimate forms of media or ultimately in real life. Those are the three things you can do. And and they've all gotten a lot harder to do for, for a variety of reasons. Here I'm going to bring up Academic Agent's idea of sensible centrism, which is his, his idea. And this comes from an Elon Musk tweet that the Democrats were no longer the sensible center. And Academic Agent said that, oh, well, that means, you know, what we, the right should do is present themselves as the sen sensible sen center. And I, I don't know if Sargon of Akkad was the originator of this, or if he, he sort of hopped on the bandwagon of academic agents idea to kind of make this the new flag of the right. But, but this was the idea was that now we're no longer being banned. The narrative should be that the right wing is the center. We, we hold all, we hold basically the positions that most people believe in and both the left and some kind of imaginary right wing. That's not us are the extremes. Uh, the, the Handmaiden's Tale from Gilead as a fictional example, uh, and and this this was it's obviously based on on Elon Musk's tweet, and um, it's very humorous, and I enjoyed the video that Sargon made describing it, but I, I feel like he's he's massively unlearned the the lessons that he was talking about in the populist delusion uh, only last year that. His example, his template for this was Tony Blair, who, who introduced radical policies into Britain that basically recreated the entire country, not the least of which was a pedal to the metal immigration policy that is, as we know after today's survey, basically meant that British people are now only, what, 75% <laughs> of the population of their own country, soon to be much, much, much less because you know, a lot of that 75% are older people who are not going to be alive in 30 years. So, uh, but he presented it as the center. Okay, that's cool. And, and right now the sensible center works on Twitter because of Elon Musk. But here's the thing, academic agent, it's like a magic trick, right? And the magic trick is the, the woman drinks the potion, the levitation potion, and then she um, she lays down, and suddenly she's levitating, and the guy moves the moves the um, the hula hoop through her to show that there's no wire connecting her to the ground. And oh wow, it's so amazing, right? Okay, the the, the levitation potion must really do its thing. Uh, the levitation potion is is sugar water. Uh, what what really is going on is that she's got this 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 steel iron bar that's uh, running through her skirt. Uh, lining her back and she can just lay down on this thing and it looks completely transparent from where you're sitting and in the meanwhile you think it's this magic levitation potion tony blair did not come to power or gain any power because he said he was a sensible centrist his allies in the european banking system and in the american media and in the clinton administration gave him power his political connections to other international NGOs gave him his power. The sensible centrist angle of Tony Blair's was an excuse. It was it was a part of the of of the narrative of the magic trick. It was the levitation potion to to sort of tell your brain a story so that you can suspend disbelief and get behind uh, the complete restructuring of Great Britain along the along the, the plans of NGOs and central banks. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's immaterial to, to recreate this. Democratic power does not work this way. I mean, it kind of does in a sense, right? In a sense, people, human beings, we always gravitate towards words. So, you know, in, in the game of politics, we're having this discussion about a given controversy. And what, what happens is 
in reality, what's going on is we're discussing political propositions. We're pitting values against each other, and we're pitting assertions about reality against each other, and we're trying to hash out what's true. Uh, but but very very often what 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 people um, gravitate towards and I did an entire series on this are the words people use right so people are very very uh, when when ordinary humans get into a political argument what what they want is they want to be on the side of the good words and they want to be against all the bad words right and in the meantime what they don't realize in this whole uh, conversation. Uh, this whole di discourse or dialectic is there's something called a framing and, and a framing is is the core assumptions that exist behind the debate itself and in particular the kind of questions that you're asking so any debate or is organized around a question and if you're not answering the right asking the right questions you're never going to get the right answers or you're, you're never going to get meaningful answers right and so uh, human minds always go towards words, good words, bad words, what I call magical words that don't really mean anything. And they always, uh, they always kind of escape from the, the larger framing structures. And so whenever I come up against a debate, like the ones that were going on on Twitter uh, between people like Academic Agent and Anglo Ortho, I always kind of, a good, a good exercise is to take the, the, the controversial terms and retranslate them out of their slogan terms and into different terms. Like, what does this phrase actually, what does civilization is incommunicable actually mean? What does we can learn something from the boomer truth regime actually mean? And if you retranslate the slogans, retranslate the words, and then rehash the controversy, and the controversy dissolves, well, then the controversy was fake to begin with. It was, it was a construction of the linguistics you chose. And so all these people who are spurging out over... Uh, you know the 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 based um, red pill pagan gang and the and this the the pseudo blue pilled Christians. Uh, you're fighting over a phantom argument. There is really nothing there when it gets right down to it. Oh, either either the questions are kind of stupid, or one side's position is kind of a, a, it, it, it's an illusion. It, it looks like something it's not. And that's generating the controversy. Um, and so what, what, what happens is um, uh, the, 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 the framing, and this is, I guess, where sensible censorism comes in. Uh, the, the idea is, is that you know, we're going to have our own magic word in sensible centrism. We're going to be using this, this, this buzzword that's going to be the good word for ourselves. Um, Sure, you know, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. You, you, I could see this kind of working. Uh, but what, what conversation are you having where this is going to come up? What, what dialogue are you actually going to be invited to where you get to present yourself as the sensible centrist? Well, it's certainly not going to be with the mainstream media, because unlike in 2015 to 2016, it bleeds, it leads on Twitter is not going to get into their pages anymore. They will close ranks. They're not going to invite Jared Taylor onto their Sunday shows anymore, like they stupidly did in 2017. And they're not going to ask those questions. Uh, they're going to psychologize them. They're going to reframe them. And by the time you get into a position of dialogue with them, you're not going to be portrayed as a sensible centrist. Uh, far from it. Okay, well, you know, who cares about the mainstream media? We have a gap in Twitter now. Okay, sure. But again, who 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 are the communities that are are we we're dialoguing dialoguing with? The whole idea, I mean, the advantage the right has over the left and the center is is dialectic. It, it happens because the, I think the core substance of the issues demonstrates that right-wing principles are, are more reliable and have more substance to them than their alternatives. But this is, um, this is not... Uh, uh, and, and in 2016, that, that got you a lot, right? Because you, you get into a... The, the left felt like it had to have a dialogue with you. And then you, you could start off by asking the right questions and then, boom, the audience is with you because the left wing is obviously fake at this stage. Yeah, the left isn't doing that anymore. They've got like a few debate me bros that stand in front of the herd uh, that, that are just that just trot out bullshit 24-7 and kind of gish gallop away from the points constantly. 
and who are trained to do that by a sort of the tactics that Destiny uses. And, and then they have a wall of silence other than that. Who is going to platform you as a, as a sensible centrist? E- Elon Musk will call you a sensible centrist on Twitter, sure. And, and that's worth something. He, he is a titan. He, he is the steel beam that makes this magic trick at least plausible, right? This, this trick of levitate, this levitation possible. But it, but it's hard to know who you're actually siphoning away from the cathedral, siphoning away from the mainstream. The one exception I can think of are people like Dev, Short Fatataku, or Adam and Sitch. Those are the those are the those are the communities where you might get platformed with the centri- sensible centrist idea. Uh, but those communities are pretty small. They're pretty small and. Here's the big kicker. And I, I'm amazed that no one asked this question. Um, who's falling for this? <laughs> I mean, sensible centrism is, um, it's kind of bullshit. I mean, we are radically out of, the, the stuff that we are, we actually internalize as values. We are aware that, that, that there's been a wrongheadedness in, in mainstream perspectives on politics and religion and ultimate value for almost a hundred years right now. For a hundred years, the West has been going in the opposite direction, by and large, than, than basic healthy, healthy human principles would recommend. Sure, maybe on immigration people are still based, but for the most part, there are numerous issues where the mainstay of public opinion is just, frankly, out of line with the correct opinions, with, with, with the correct values, and with opinions that are more aligned to reality. So by definition, what you're, what you're hoping to do, you're hoping to sort of accomplish the same trick that Blair did. You're hoping that people are going to hear good word, good word, good word, and gravitate towards you, and, and not ask themselves, and, and not have any follow-up questions, and, and not... I mean, the obvious re- the, the obvious reposts are going to be coming, even if you do bring this to people like Dev and Adam and Sitch. Uh, this isn't being made in a vacuum. For every position you portray as sensibly centrist, they're going to go to your internet history and they're going to find five of them that sound absolutely nuts by modern standards. I don't think that they're ultimately nuts, but their mainstream normie audience is going to think that they're nuts because they're way out of whack with what the mainstream has been telling them for, for their entire lives. And, and furthermore, the fact that they're, be, they're being presented as centrist opinions is going to seem, make them seem dishonest, in my honest opinion. Uh, this framing trick only works when it's being supplied directly with power. Uh, just like the levitation potion only works when there's a little metal bar uh, on the inside of the floating woman's uh, dress so that she can actually lay down on it and not fall to the floor. And once that power is taken away, and it's not hard to take power away from a right, even when it's unbanned from Twitter, uh, that sort of magical word is going to get deconstructed and it's and it's going to fall flat. And and maybe, and, you know, of course, you'll get into dialogue with Dev and Adam and Sitch's community with this tactic, probably. This will probably get you an audience with a lot of those people. A, those communities are actually pretty small relative to what was up for grabs in 2016. B, uh, you know, you'll see how, how far you get with them trying to sell them uh, positions that are, frankly speaking, radical, just objectively speaking. And, and C, and most importantly, uh, what kind of people are we getting? I mean, we're getting the kind of people that 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 want to that want to be centrists that want to go with the flow that want to listen to the good words and be nice to people and and not offend anybody and they they care a lot in the moment that that they're associated with the good word sensible centrist is a good word and so i want to be associated with it so i want to be with the sensible centrists so now all of a sudden i am reading julius savola um or joseph de maestra to pick an author I much prefer. Um, th- this is a foundation built on sand. This is a foundation completely built on sand, and, and you're, you're going to get exactly what you got previously and exactly what exists on Twitter. You're going to get an audience that's a mile wide and an inch deep. And this is not the way to, to actually uh, 
run a movement. And um, all the while when I'm, I'm hearing this stuff about this, the, the sensible center, my mind's being drawn to a, a certain controversy. And this is, I, I, I know I'm not the hour, but I got kind of another rant going here. And uh, so now that I've sort of disclosed my mind about sensible centrism, uh, forgive me for, for sort of segueing into this because I think it's related. Whenever I hear a sensible centrism, I think of this one word that anyone who is aware of, well, in particular, Protestant Christianity, but if you are a Catholic who is in the apologetic community, you'll be aware of this word too. And that word is winsomeness. Winsomeness. Be winsome. Be friendly. Uh, you know, go, go, go out and make everyone like you. And, you know, there's tons of people who want to be liked. And, you know, we'll be the people who attract the people who want to be liked. This was the strategy of a lot of apologists in the 90s and in the 2000s. Last week, I was criticized for being overly harsh on this community, a community I call evangelicals. But I don't know what to call these people anymore. I, I don't know what to call these people anymore because they, kind, they, they resist... They, they resist, um, they're, they're non-denominational for the most part, and, and they have a very particular character, and they're very, very prominent in American life, and, and there, there's, no, there's no way, to, they, they have to be part of the conversation, I'll say that. Um, win, winsomeness was the strategy that the Christianity had gotten a bad rap from the 1980s. And that what it really needed to do was to be friendly and happy, clappy, and accessible to young people, so that it could get a lot of people in it who 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 who, who were, didn't feel like they were listened to. Modernity had cast a lot of people aside, and it was for Christians to kind of make things comfortable for them. And the um um I'm I'm just reviewing my notes here. Pardon me if I seem a little distracted. Um the The um, this strategy, I think, is one of the most failed evangelical strategies. Um, I, I mean, evangelical in the broadest sense of the word uh, of the last century. It it's it, it fundamentally misunder it fundamentally misunderstood what was going on in the culture war. It fundamentally misunderstood what Christianity was like. It fundamentally misunderstood how people perceived religion. And, and it focused on creating these types of churches that were very, very shallow and that were entirely focused around individual characters or individual personalities, uh, the, the sort of mega pastor that was, that, was, that, was, that was sort of the soul of the church. And, and it collected a number of people who, who were very, very focused on, on being liked. And worse than that, it, it created a generation of younger people who were similarly focused on, on being likable and being liked. I always remember that there was this, uh, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. I think that he, he, he recites his conversion story and it happens when he encounters a Christian woman who's really, really nice to him. And he has this very, very powerful conversion and comes to embrace Christianity with all of the spiky bits and all of the darker parts and you know, he's a very, very firm believer. But people who followed in sort of his wake have centered winsomeness as, as the core of their religion to begin with. And, and so now the phenomenon of this has kind of borne fruit. And, and I really don't know what to make of this at all. I know that Jay Burden is doing a podcast really at the same time as this one where he discloses his mind about these types of people. Uh, but, but you can see this in this, in this recent controversy. Um, there is a Christian school that, that was associated with, um, I, I think a variety, I, I don't, I don't know exactly what the, the denomination is, right? Um, it was, um, but it was, it, I think it was some prod, it was, it was, um, I'm, I'm not going to name the, I'm not going to name the school here for my notes. I feel like this is. I kind of don't want to proceed, proceed this controversy with more notoriety. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of actually wondering how I should approach this topic to begin with because it's so kind of thorny. Maybe I should start it this way. Uh, 
Rod Dreher was a huge influence on my own formation towards Christianity. And I had come in contact with a bunch of evangelicals who were very, very winsome and very, very friendly and who were, you know, really kind of trying to sucker at me and, and sucker me and sounds wrong because I think that the religion is true. They're really trying to entice me to go to their church. And I was really, really, you know, I liked them and I was souring on new atheism. And so this was a, this was a perspective that I kind of, and I was, you know, I was a big fan of C.S. Lewis. I hadn't read Chesterton yet. And during this time, I, get, I kind of discovered the blog of Rod Dreher, who complained a lot, a lot about this stuff. He complained about this evangelical attitude. Uh, and he, um, he kind of proposed this alternative version of, of Christianity that he called, well, back then he called it crunchy conservatism. Later, he would call it the Benedict Option, that Christians need to be kind of, um, you know, we need to live our faith. But the darker parts need to be prominent, and they're not going to be palatable to the mainstream. So we kind of need to live apart from the mainstream. We need to have our own communities, but we need to hold the line. Because he, he was seeing, and he correctly predicted, exactly what would happen to this winsome Christianity when it came in contact with the full force of secularized modernity. The, the children of these winsome Christians that went out into the world in 2008 and 2009 did not encounter an environment like the 1990s. They encountered the new atheists. And the new atheists were much more sophisticated than, than these Christian kids and were way more aggressive and carried themselves with a lot more poise. And it cut through this stuff like a knife through butter. Because as soon as the, the nice words went away, as soon as it came down to examining the hard beliefs, as soon as the frame changed, all of the winsomeness just flooded right out of the room. And you get to this, it, you, you got down to the core where the attrition rate for evangelicals became insanely high. And I know, you know there will be people in the audience, and I think I pissed off uh, the good old boys when I talked about this last week. And I really don't know how to talk about it because it's not my community, but I can't say I don't see this stuff. Uh, everybody can see how this works. And Blue America can see this very obviously. The, the evangelical community is a stalwart against progressivism, but it gets the stuffing beat out of it consistently because its attrition rates are very, very high, and the attrition rates go straight into progressive uh, the progressive um, world. The ex-evangelicals become the soldiers for the progressive movement. Furthermore... <laughs> Furthermore, they don't just take 10% randomly. They take 10% off the top, which means that the evangelical community is being brain-drained every year by, by progressive America. They're basically, they don't need children. Progressive Americans don't need children. They have yours. And, and that's because the entire movement didn't have any roots. It didn't. And, or, or it had roots, but the roots were all sort of individual pastors as far as i could figure you know pr people like the guy from the mars hill uh church that, that i saw in seattle and he, he had he had a downfall too for some strange reason that i'm not going to get into in this podcast but rod Dreher was was made sense to me because he was talking about building roots you know okay obviously christianity is out of sync with the times duh Right, you, you never hear that from my evangelical friends, but for any person who lived in Seattle or Portland at that time, this idea that the stuff that they were promoting in, in their events was cutting edge was obviously ridiculous. Christianity was ra radically out of sync with the times, radically out of sync with the degenerated modern world. But, as Rod Dreher would say, Christianity is in line with an older world that's deeper and has more truth to it. And, and, and that what, what we really need to do is we really need to build these deep roots. We'll never move from this core truth, from this classical wisdom, from, from these older ways of doing things that are tried and true methods that our ancestors have done and that, that obviously lead to better results than the progressive world. And you know, this is the message that really kind of gaunt me. 
I didn't want to be in sync with the with the with the progressive world I was in. I certainly didn't want to be winsome towards it. The whole reason why I was even considering Christianity at the time was that I saw the utter moral bankruptcy of the secular progressive world around me, and I wanted absolutely no part in it. And so I, I found this. I found this very very compelling i'm like why are you guys shying away from the old testament the old testament is your 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 most based your most profound not your most profound but it's one of the most profound pieces of the scriptures it, it, it grounds uh, god's communication with the human race inside a struggle inside the struggle of one people that, that's very, very real. That's very particular. That's very bloody. That feels like it actually comes from real life. And that doesn't feel like a, a car commercial or, or a television ad or, or a cartoon. This is an actual document that came from the Bronze Age or you know, later the Iron Age or whatever. The, this is something that, that, that has substance to it. And, you know, oh, no, but just, just, just follow the, the parts of the Bible that, are, that make you feel good or that, that, are, that are very winsome to the secular world. But that seemed to be the exact opposite direction. And so, okay, you know, you think, well, this, this is something that, that, that I can get behind. Rod Dreher, he, he is someone who understands what the problem is. And so I follow this, this guy. And I've, I've been following Rod for years now. And the problem is, is that his project, and I, I'm not so sure exactly, it's hard to know where, where to begin with this. <laughs> In some sense, he was not the man he presented himself as being. He was not a rock that did not move. And, and he was not a possessor of some kind of consistent tradition. He was not uh, the, 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 the unmovable fixture of a community. And I, I guess that's sort of deeply personal. But Rod Dreher sold himself. He sold his own. I mean, he wrote three, I read three or four of his books. And a majority of those books were his biography. He wrote a book about Dante that was most, mostly his biography. Uh, or, or, you know, what was happening to him in, this, in, in his own life during this time. And... And, and and furthermore, the conversation never never evolved for Rod. He he um, time uh, w w the culture war got worse and worse and worse, as he predicted. Christians lost and lost and lost with their winsome attitudes, and and Christian life further degraded towards sort of a, a, a secular life with a Christian veneer on top of it, and. But, but every time Rod came in contact with people who were making a harder break or who were more aggressive towards the mainstream, he immediately backed away. He immediately kind of, I remember early on in reading Rod Dreher, he, he did this, uh, this huge counter signal against uh, Mencius Mulbug. And he described him as some kind of deplorable villain. Um, <laughs> And think about it. I think I read Bench's Bullbug because I read Unqualified Reservations and I didn't get much out of it my first reading. I was like, okay, it's kind of wordy and, and you know, he's got some points here, but what's the ultimate point of it? And, but, for, but to Rod Reher, this guy was a, this guy was a villain. He was corrupting the youth away from, you know, this liberal vision of, 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 of Christianity. Of course, this liberal vision, we, we would still keep our deep Christian roots. But, but everything else about our lives would be intact and modern. And the bad adoption of separation, well, well, that was like, that was figurative kind of. It was never really clear what was being separated from the bad adoption. But it was kind of off to the side. It was just, it was sort of a caution. We need to keep this in mind. Okay. Um, but you slowly begin to realize that, that Rod has absolutely no self-awareness about his... Uh, about, I mean, his, his, basically, you know, and I don't want to make this personal, but I mean, his own community and his own relations was, was, were falling apart behind the scenes to the, to the point now where he's entirely based out of Hungary, a country that he has no connection to, uh, other than he was invited once to speak at an event with Viktor Orban, I think. And, and, the, and his connections to the community he wrote so much about across all his books is gone. Uh, furthermore, um, 
you know, he seems to have no aware awareness of of what a political battle actually looks like, or or how communities are are built, and. Just this week, there was a scandal involving a Christian school. I mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, there was um, so everyone knows about this this new thing, Christian nationalism. I've been highly critical of this pro- project because I don't like the word nationalism. And but you know, I'm willing to roll with it, right? If we want to use a modern term, let's use Christian nationalism. They basically just mean Christian stewardship and the pursuit of of sort of political stewardship. In, in the way that most Christians would have practiced it for the the late twentieth century, and as far as I'm, I'm, I, I think I read some blurbs from the book. Uh, it was by Stephen Wolf, and um, and, uh, it, and it seemed. I mean, compared to most of the stuff we talk about in the distant right, it was pretty tame. And I think one of the ideas they introduced was kinism, which is the entire. I mean, I think I don't know exactly how they phrase it. But, but it's the entirely consistent Christian notion that you have a greater responsibility to those who are close to you than you do to those who are far away from you, uh, both in lineage and in, 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 in proximity. And, in, and you can't, for instance, sell your children into slavery uh, even to buy the freedom of another person. Uh, that's, that, that, is, that is an evil act because you have a direct responsibility to take care of your children. And they have put their trust in you not to betray them. And to sell them out, even to accomplish a greater good, is an act of betrayal to their greater interests. And you're not called to sacrifice other people on the altar of some imagined greater good. And so, you know, as far as I could figure out, what Wolf was commending was more or less in keeping with what most Christians believed about their political responsibilities until very, very, very recently. The, the sort of winsome dimension of the evangelical Christians, possibly notwithstanding. Okay, well then, here we go. Uh, you know, recently, Stephen Wolf was very closely associated with this another man called Thomas Ackward, who worked at a classical Christian academy, which is, again, one of these academies uh, Christians have. I think it was Protestant of some kind, to sort of separate their educational system from that of the cathedrals, from that of the mainstreams. And what kicks off in this is, is a battle between Wolf and Accord and, and Alistair Roberts and Rod Dreher. And, and this is one of the most embarrassing inter-Christian fights I've ever seen in my entire life and, and demonstrates, I mean, if these are the leaders we have, uh, if these are the political leaders we have in charge of Christianity, we are in serious trouble. And, but, but, Watching it from afar, this is this is what I'm seeing. Again, th- these are I, I can tell most of these people are are come from kind. I don't I know people object to me saying they come from red states. All, all I know is that these people don't behave like people who are raised in my community, raised around the coast, typically behave. Uh, they don't talk the same way and they don't act the same way. And I know I know Rod Dreher lived an enormous amount of time in New York, and but. He somehow didn't absorb any of the perspectives most New Yorkers take to conflicts of this variety, and, and he doesn't speak like one. And 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 so I, I feel like I'm kind of watching this struggle from afar and, and trying to make heads or tails out of it. But but what happens is that uh, one of Stephen Wolf's close associates, uh, Mr. Accord, is um is is this teacher. He's one of the founding members of this class Christian school that Rod Reher is also associated with. I guess his kids went there or something for a brief period of time. And it's it, it, Roberts, who's an opponent of Wolf, he, he writes this long essay where he takes, I mean, it's, 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 it's largely about the author of Christian nationalism. And it's obvious that he has an ideological beef with this person and that he doesn't like this idea of Christian nationalism. But then, strangely enough, he, he veers into an, an attack, uh, basically in a, a doxing campaign against Thomas Accord. And, and it, he, ex, he exposes, I guess we can say expose now, that Thomas Accord was, was running a Twitter account. And, and this Twitter account was uh, 
uh, basically like participating in the right wing meme culture that we all know on the distant right, in which I recommend people do not participate in. But he was, um, you know, he was the the leader of a classic Christian academy. Uh, by day, doing a, you know a very good job by all accounts, teaching children, bringing them up in in the in the trivium, and and informing young minds to to think separately from the 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 structures of the cathedral and all that stuff. And, but but I guess by night or or uh, sometimes he would get on Twitter and he would he would make aggressive posts against women or you participate in the banter that has like racist edges to it. And he, he would bat post. He would, he would, he would give the kind of banter that people know from, from the bronze age, per, uh, the, 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 the sort of macho, uh, front people do pull in the, in the bronze age per, pervert community where you, you like put down women and you, you, you talk, you talk like you're some kind of Conan, the barbarian character who's going to drive, your enemies before you and hear the lamentations of the women and, and you mix it in with like racial slurs and all this stuff and and, and of course you can imagine uh that that for a person who who sort of presents themselves as a christian gentleman in their ordinary lives uh the this is uh very embarrassing right and um and and of course so roberts exposes this guy gets him fired from his job and uh you know of course his family depends on this job so how who knows how they're going to feed themselves in this era of high food prices and and low job availability especially in rural areas but but good job on you roberts uh you know you got this guy fired and then he kicks off this, this sort of inquisition to track down exactly what was said and done uh by thomas accord Thomas Accord fires back and, of course, does the worst thing you could ever do. And he lies about owning the Twitter account and, and later confesses to it, which immediately makes his defenders uh, look like idiots. Uh, this is something that I think, I hope people understand that you never, ever do this. Uh, I have had a few people, and this kind of relates to my uh, leaving Twitter originally. Right When I originally left Twitter... Um, I, I I didn't leave Twitter because of this reason, but but around that time, there are a few people who who approached me, and they had dug up uh, a person from my past who was basically cyber stalking me for years, and and who had sent sort of weird threatening messages to me and my wife, and had made up completely fabricated stories about us. And, and they threatened to sort of expose my real name and, and, and send this information to my employer and get me fired and, you know, all the usual stuff, right? And, um, and uh, this is the thing. Uh, and the, the right response, the response I did give um, is you, you just say, like, go do it. If... I told the person blankly, look, this person, you're not, you think you're exposing a secret about me. We well know this. We, we know this person. My, my wife and I know this person well as a stalker for years and, and as a person who's, who's made up fabulous stories about uh, me. And we, were, we, we usually deny it. The second you drop this stuff, we will absolutely deny it. I will be out in front counter accusing you of doxing me and of enabling a cyber stalker and my wife will accuse you at once and we will immediately disprove the veracity of these claims. And if you want to buy to that, do you want to like, we'll go to war and I have no, I stand by my opinions 100% and I stand by everything I said on this channel 100%. And if you want to go to war over this, if you want to enable a cyber stalker and dox people and you want to have that be your reputation, I'm good to go. And of course, what happens then is that the coward slinks away and doesn't do anything, as is usual. These accusations have no feet. Once you know you are a prey species, as Moolbug says. But if you stomp your feet, if the if the elephant stomps its feet and and makes it clear that he's in the mood to to skewer a lion on his tusks today, even at the risk of his own life, that lion's going to decide that it's not worth the fight and he's going to slink away, and or in this case, the jackal. Uh, and that, that's how you respond to cancellation can't attempts. Complete honesty, complete ownership, and then reply with aggression. 
you want to bring this fight on, bring it. Of course, Accord didn't do this because he lives in a time warp or something and decided to slink away from it, misrepresent his position, and then make all of his supporters look like they're idiots by later coming out and confessing it after they already stood up and defended him uh, on the pretense that this was a false accusation. Um, but that's, that's actually the, the lesser of the two things because... What happens from Rod Dreher's, and I don't know if I'm properly illustrating this to people, because sort of the, the shocking dimension to this is can't be understated. And uh, because it was obvious from the get-go that the target of these accusations was not Accord, it was Wolf. That's how the initial doxing attempts went, and that's how the firing went. And... Um, the, the behavior of the accusers is absolutely atrocious. First of all, if I were to see this, if I were to read his account objectively, I would say this. You know, let, let's say, for instance, that I was in, in the position of the headmaster of the school, and I'd come across uh, the account of a professor who had, uh, who had, unbeknownst to me, had a double life as a shitposting right-wing troll. Uh, you know, no one know, no one in the community knows that this shit posting right wing troll exists, uh, but it's conduct unbecoming a Christian gentleman. It's conduct un obviously, and it can't continue. Um, I would assume, because I know this person and I'm friends with them, and I'm close with them, that what happened was that this guy had logged on to participate in right wing Twitter, and he he got angry. And he got revved up by the crowd. And these, this was kind of an excited utterance, the way you might yell at a sports game. Like, you know, like, D pull a Sam Hyde. You could say, Hassan Piker, I'm coming to murder you in real life, right? That kind of thing. Uh, that's what Twitter is. Twitter are, Twitter are those moments of pure catharsis in, a, in, in 288 characters every second of every day. That's what makes it so addictive, right? It makes you angry. It makes you engaged. It's like you're cheering for your side constantly every second. And so you can't put the phone down. And that's why it corrodes your attention span. Um, and because I'm reasonably competent, because I come from this age of the world, I know how social media works. I'm not stuck in the 90s. I'm not pretending like social media is something this guy sent out via email. I'm not, I'm not pretending like this, that he published this in a book. I, I'm aware that this happens instantaneously and, and with actually a minimal amount of thought oftentimes. And so I would, very, I would charitably examine this and conclude that, that he doesn't necessarily believe all these things, but he is exhibiting, again, conduct unbecoming a Christian gentleman. I would then probably ask him to delete the account minimally, apologize, privately to the people he offended, and maybe at the discretion of the institution, I would, uh, I, I might like, I might ask for a public apology and I might ask for like, you know, maybe some minor disciplinary action, maybe a suspension or something, a slap on the wrist, right? Um, this, you know, and, and um, what, what really happened was they, they went after him with everything they could. They got him, again, like I said, they got him fired from his job. But, but more than that, like, they, they, what, 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 what happens with, uh, with, with these people is um, they take his worst tweet quotes. Think of the worst thing you've ever written on social media, anonymously, in, in, in Call of Duty, in a gamer forum, uh, you know, during during the playoff season when you're you're tweeting out how much you want to uh murder the other team's quarterback or how much you know uh, or or you know weird sexual innuendo to, to piss off the other team um whatnot think of the worst thing you've ever written anonymously on the internet okay the frame that Roberts takes, and the frame that Dreher, Dreher takes this controversy that's confined to this Christian college, he, blow, he publishes it on his blog and blows it up to national proportion. And when he does this, he takes the worst aspects you could possibly assume about the worst thing this person has ever posted and portray them as if they were like his secret beliefs. 
He's a Trojan horse, Rod Dreher writes, for white nationalist, racist, anti-Jewish attitudes. He's trying to smuggle them into our children. He's trying to secretly indoctrinate students to become neo-Nazis. And this exposes him. The person that showed up every day and who was my good friend and colleague, that's the fake person. The, the real person is these five 288 character tweets. That's the real person. That, the, these weren't a mistake. This is an exposure that he's actually a secret alien Nazi on the inside. He, he has no soul. He has no internal struggle. He has no weakness. He, he just is a Nazi. And, and, and now we need to destroy him. No, we don't need to destroy him. We need to destroy him. And then we need to go to every single other person who is his friends. And if they do not denounce him, and I, I, you think I'm making this, I'm not making this up. Rod Dreher actually did this. He goes to all of uh, Accord's friends and, and demands that not only do they disagree with the tweets, which obviously they would disagree with the tweets, right? I bet Accord's would, would renounce the spicier elements of the tweets if they were brought to his attention. Not only do they demand that they renunciate the content of the tweets, they, they demand moral condemnation of the man in, in the strongest possible terms. And when they respond with sort of a hesitant, well, I'm very disappointed. It seems like he must have been under a lot of stress. This might be a mistake. Let's be charitable. They're immediately guilty of the same Nazi conspiracy. They're on the same Trojan horse to indoctrinate Americans' Christian youth with white supremacy. Yeah, the conspiracy to convert Christian youth to white supremacy in 2022, Roger Ayer. That's what's going on. That you, You've uncovered a cell of secret moon Nazis, and their, their plan was to create a robot who would perfectly imitate a kind Christian teacher in real life, and then occasionally post 4chan sentiments and game rewards anonymously online. That was the grand plan. But now everyone is contaminated. Now the entire school is contaminated. You see the responses to Rod Dreher's posts, and it's very, very apparent that the, the students of this classical academy, they're being encouraged to participate in, in this struggle session. They're hopping on the bandwagon. Oh my God, it's, it's, the, it's the struggle against white supremacy. Here at last, at Christian College, we have to fight against the enemies of, 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 uh, of what? The modern progressive order? What even is white supremacy? Who, who invented that term? Is that a progressive term? Would people have even understood what white supremacy was in the age of Chesterton or... What would they even have made of that? It's a moral panic. But now, Roger says, who, who, how do we know who to trust? Thomas Accord could have influenced anybody. They all could be secret Nazis now. And the entire... I mean, saying this on a national platform, which is what kills me. Every, everyone is a suspect. Every, everyone is a suspect now. And... Uh, and, and now the school probably needs to close. He ends with this. I, 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 th I think that the school might, the, the classic Christian academy that we developed here is, is going to, it might have to close because who knows, it's such a dis besmirchment of our reputation that this happened, that, that we, we, all Christians need to do is just cannibalize each other. For, for any kind of infraction or association with this one person. We need to cancel Stephen Wolf because he's associated with this guy. We need to cancel his fellow teachers because they're associated with this guy. On and on and on until they join the insane mob that, that Dreher has kicked up. What the hell? I mean, talk about falling for the leftist's frame. Has, has Rod Dreher done any uh, introspection on this whatsoever? What if this had been? I mean, let, let's get this. And you know, and I talked to the people who were who were on this mob on Twitter the other day. The the people who were in this group, of of of. I think this was one of the students, although I'm not sure. But this was one of those. This one of these. This type of student. And these people are conservatives. They they, they think that they, they're they're raging against CRT because they've because they've read, uh, which they wouldn't be 
had they not been reading right-wing Twitter. So, so even their spicy right-wing takes come from, from the very spheres on Twitter that they, 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 that they otherwise would freak out when they read. Uh, but, so the, but they're very against CRT, and, and they, 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 use the, they use the language of CRT even though it's kind of meaningless. And, 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 but they're also really against white supremacy, which, which anyone who, who's paid any attention to these, what they call CRT authors, would know that the obsession with the conspiracy to create uh, to, a, a, a secret white supremacist moving through our institutions is one of the hallmark beliefs pushed by people like Ibram X. Kendi and ta Coates and Charles Blower, anyone from these, these places, any, any of these journalists, any of these academic, any, Robin DiAngelo, and any of, these, uh, any of these thinkers throughout the academy, they all believe this. But, but now, um, what's so funny is, so, so they're very, very worried about CRT, which they get from edgy right-wing spaces that they renounce. And they're also very, very worried about white supremacy, which they've gotten, from, unbeknownst to them apparently, they've gotten this, this paranoia about white supremacy uh, from the very left-wing, what they call CRT people that they denounce. And they're trying to marry these things together in the most insane way imaginable. Right in the most in 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 the most insane lopsided way imaginable. If this had been, for instance, like let's let's question the frame here. So they're they're very much against white supremacy and CRT. Okay, so let's say, for instance, that as opposed to Thomas Accord being a white guy who published tweets supporting white supremacy, what if he was a black professor who tweeted tweets. Uh, like that, that New York Times tech columnist, all of these anti-white tweets, all of these sort of an genocidally anti-white tweets. Then she got hired by the New York Times. I forget what her, her name was, but everyone remembers that controversy. And, and if you don't like her, you can pick half a dozen other ones that, that periodically go in and out of these institutions and that, that talk about these, these, these that, that voices incredibly anti-white sentiments. What if it was a black professor, a black Christian who, who got caught uh, you know, talking about how we need to kill Whitey on, on Twitter uh, under a pseudonym. Would, would they have fired him and then conducted a witch hunt uh, to, to try to purge the institution of any, uh, anyone who was guilty of his taint? I know they wouldn't have because A, they would have immediately taken a charitable interpretation. They would have allowed himself to explain himself or they would have interpreted, oh, like, well, okay, he's angry because of George Floyd, and then he got caught up in the wrong communities. They also wouldn't have canceled him because they wouldn't have dared to cancel him because the powers that be would have stood behind him. If this had been an affair, or maybe, Rod, a messy public divorce, also sins, by the Christian understanding, also, huge failures to live up and comport oneself in the manner expected by a Christian gentleman. Uh, would, would Mr. Accord have been fired? Would he have been disciplined? Would he have been purged from the ranks? And not only that, would all his friends be forced to publicly denounce him? Would this be broadcast at a national level to further make him unemployable? Would, would that have happened, Rod? Would that have been the response had this been a moral failing of the Christian variety that you yourself acknowledge as a mortal sin? No. So we wouldn't do it for ordinary moral failings. We, you know, if, 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 for instance, if, if Thomas Accord had gotten angry at a football game and he had yelled, he had yelled, I'm going to kill you, so-and-so, like Sam Hyde. Would, would they have fired him from his job? They might have disciplined him, right? Conduct unbecoming of a Christian gentleman, certainly. Um, no. The, the only thing, none of these sins would have triggered the Inquisition. None of these moral failings would have triggered the Inquisition. The only one that triggers the Inquisition is the, is, is the moral failing that directly corresponds to the agenda of the people in power. What, what do you want me to make of this? This, this is, it's obviously political. 
and, and you know, for some people, I don't know what what half the people and maybe they're progressives, right? Maybe they just think that the current direction of of mainstream thought is fundamentally right. They just want to have it be more Christian. Um, you know what? Obviously, is I think a very naive perspective, but understandable. But Roger Hearn knows that's not the case. Roger Hearn is a conservative, and yet he's essentially destroying an institution for uh, for for progressive values in the name of progressivism. It, not not in the name of defending against sin, because we've established that sin almost certainly wouldn't have taken this professor down. Had it been any other sin, it's on, the only one that elicits this kind of response that isn't like murder or rape is, are, are, are the sins that the progressive cathedral deem as being cancelable. And, and you, you've manufactured a situation that will destroy your school. You've destroyed it because you destroyed the moral credibility. It, it cannot stand for anything now. Because now not only the teachers are aware that they play by progressive rules. The students have seen it also. And the, the, and the students know, as human beings, they understand when there are power asymmetries. They understand when, when there are double standards and double standards come into play. Uh, they can see this and they can respond to this. This is, um, this, this is uh, they're, they're going to see how adults react to this. And they'll, they'll, they'll say to themselves, everything is forgivable except for the sins that progressives don't like. Everything, it's, it's all good. We, we're all flawed human beings until we cross the line of the cathedral. And they'll realize that their philosophy is not independent and autonomous. They have no right to judge the mainstream. The, the progressive worldview sets the balance of the debate and post-1969 rules are supreme. And any notion of loyalty to ethnicity or to kinship, as Wolf puts it, is, is just racism. Does Rod Dreher believe it? Is Rod Dreher willing to engage in a conversation about it? I don't even really care because Rod Dreher has shown me exactly what resistance he can put up to the, any ideas on this topic, which is that he immediately bows down to the progressive perspective immediately. And as such, there will never be a Bennett adoption community. Period. I mean, he, 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 you can see the balance immediately laid out in front of you. Human beings are sinful. Eventually, somebody will sin in that community. And when they do, when they have a moment of failure, based on the example set for them in this moment, every other Christian is going to dogpile them. And they're going to tear the institution apart in a giant politicized witch hunt. And, and it's for the good of their enemies it's for the good of their enemies. They're, they're throwing their community under the bus. What this results in is just this, it results in a picture of Dreher. I, I don't know what to make of this. It, I always kind of forgave Dreher, his, these, these inconsistencies, because I, I, I imagined him to be a truly innocent person. But, I imagine that he was such he was so kind of like blithely good that that doing so, like breaking from the Christian tradition at all would be unthinkable to him. And so he didn't really have the wherewithal to understand the nuance of how institutions can be subverted or how your opponent can get you to do your dirty work for you or how you have to as a human you have to sort of uh, demystify words by changing definitions and changing contexts to make sure that you're not playing by your enemy's rules. Uh, flip the races of of the, the the parties involved and ask yourself if it will play out the same way. Flip the language around, uh, like I just did with the with the accord example. Um, the uh, he he's just so unaware. He's so innocent of it, but. They say, you know, oftentimes innocence is mistaken for weakness. And this happens in the case of Jesus a lot, especially with Protestant, um, especially with sort of the, 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 the liberal Protestant, I should say, perspectives, is that they, they take all the, the goods, they take all the, the meek and mild elements of Jesus' stories and they magnify them 
and he ended up he ends up so- sounding like this soppy hippie and you you don't catch the moments where he's talking about hellfire and throwing furniture down chairs or 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 standing up to violence uh these are not parts of the stories and so um you know what what oftentimes the the supreme innocence of christ uh can can seem to our modern eyes like its weakness but in rod dreher's example it's almost the reverse it's it's weakness it's weakness hiding behind the pretense of innocence all I see now is I see someone else trying to condemn another man for sins that he probably wouldn't condemn himself for. I, I see I see a tower of hypocrites, and I see a person who constantly talks about community, but but looking at his past has nothing but a string of devastated communities behind him. Everything he participates in completely collapses. Uh, because he immediately folds. He does not defend. He, he does not treat his co-religionists with charity. And he, 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 all, all he wants is a template that he can emotionally spurg out over, you know, cry about, and then, and then kind of emotionally react against. That's not leadership. That's not strength. That's not charity. And of course, the direction of these spurg outs, the direction of these pearl-clutching moments of self-righteousness righteousness, are always in the direction acceptable to the middle-of-the-road boomer truth regime. They're, they're designed to play well in prime time and to sell to a certain kind of audience. And to me, it just seems incredibly performative. I've, I've kind of rambled. I've kind of had two, two discussions here. One about the sensible centrism, the other about Rod Dreher and the failures of Christian leadership, but they're connected. It does not behoove anyone to fill a movement with weak men who will betray each other. That's why winsomeness failed. Winsomeness created entire institutions that fell like dominoes the moment one person started crying. And so they create a market premium for crying. If we adopt sensible centrism, Sorry. I, if we adopt sensible centrism, I feel that we are on the same path. We are on the path of developing a bunch of people who will cave the second the frame is changed on them, the second the narrative appears to be going against them. There's no space for that anymore. There's, there's no reason to believe in this anymore. The only thing that can prop up a, a proper community, online or in real life, is strong men who are morally astute and conduct themselves properly. And here's sort of the other half of the, the side of the coin. Because this, this is, um, you know, Accord, Thomas Accord, who is sort of the victim in this process, and I do think he was a victim, I do think he got caught up in the wrong scene. He, he, caught, he, he got caught using game words. I don't think he meant them. I don't think he was a secret racist robot wearing the skin suit of a Christian gentleman. I think that he was a genuine Christian gentleman who cared about his own ethnicity and who got genuinely angry at all the anti-white stuff and decided to meme back aggressively in turn. And... That that's my ch- apparently I'm giving him way more charity than his closest friends and his colleagues, but there you go. From my reading, it he deserves that charity. That being said, you know he he, he didn't act in the way he should have. He, he 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 is suffering from a moment of weakness. He 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 did not connect himself in, in the mode of of a proper Christian gentleman. And you know, I I haven't always myself. I, I should I should say I'm I'm as guilty as the next person, but but at least I hope that we can catch ourselves while while doing this, uh, because just as we can't sort of use sensible centrism to to invite the world uh, and create a substrate of people who will cave on you the second the center is portrayed as having shifted, um, or the the moment the right person starts crying, uh, we we also can't have a bunch of radical people who, 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 whose only strong element about them is their ability to fight on the internet. 
Uh, your ability to have moral continence. I mean, I, I was to say, Rod Dreher is sort of the example of uh, emotional incontinence. But there is also something to be said for, for moral continence, the ability to sort of hold yourself morally and, and not to sort of cave into the, the, the latest temptation towards wrath or the latest temptation towards lust. And this is sort of what creates the boundaries of the conversation here. Because this castle we've inherited, this, this lottery winning that's been delivered to us, has been delivered in the form of courtship, of depleted uranium fuel rods. We can use it, we can touch it, but it degrades us morally every time we do use it or touch it. So we have to be very, very careful how we deal with this stuff. We need to somehow translate the moment we have. We have about 12 months before the cathedral finds some way to lock down Musk again and, and to reban people on Twitter. You have 12 months of a microphone. You have 12 months to try to expose as much information, um, as much media lies as you possibly can and get them circulated. You have 12 months probably to start the discourses that are still possible in 2022. But at the back end of that 12 months, you don't want a huge long list of followers or internet anons or people who are there just for the drama or people who are there just because you're winsome or people who are just there because you're on the right side of history or because you're at the sensible center. What you want is to have a list of fellow allies that are solid, that are moral, and that are capable of giving and receiving loyalty. This is what, this is what's, this is what's, we need people who are people who have their heads screwed on properly. We need people who are some uh, minimally strong constitutionally and morally. And really anything else beyond that is, is immaterial because they're all numbers on the screen. They're, they're all democratic power, which is not going to be there in two years. The people who are here for this populist surge are going to lose interest by the time the wave crests. The only people who push it are the leaders. And, you know, you're, there's two ways you can weaken yourself. You can weaken yourself like Rod Dreher and become a slave to emotions and a slave to a moral system and to a sensibility he doesn't even understand himself or apparently live out. Or... Or you can weaken yourself in the way that Thomas Ackford did or in the way that many people are doing online when they engage with Twitter. Uh, Angela Orth, though, he was in a controversy with Academic Agent. I'm 100% on his side with his observations. Uh, we can't be using Twitter. If Twitter degrades us to the point where we're using it for thirst posting and we're using it for cooking up drama to, to drive views on live streams, We've missed our opportunity in a major way. Uh, that's useless. And when they lock it down, that benefit's going to go away. We didn't get nothing out of the surge in 2016. What we got, what, what, I should say this. What did we have after the initial surge in 2016 when they finally locked us down and they banned our accounts? What we had were and these weren't actual gains. We had discredited partially the media and we had secured a small group of men who were stronger than the ordinary crop of Republican men who usually stood, stood up for these things and who were more willing to go the distance. And in the end, that's all we can really hope to obtain and that we should, hope, that we should get. Sensible centrism if it gives you that. But moral strength before that and with that i guess i'm done with my monologue a little bit rambly uh but i guess a lot of people tuned in for this one so um anyway i'm going to go into the super chats uh the d uh, the not d live the entropy link is in the description and thank you guys in advance for super chatting wow very generously uh, already 300 dollars um but i really appreciate it uh, i'm gonna have to sell this up before bitcoin further depreciates <laughs> Um, but anyway, I'm going to waste no time in going on to these super chats since I'm way over time with a monologue. Tim Hoffman for $15 USA. Hi, Dave. 
I've been away from the Catholic Church for 10 plus years now. Can you offer some advice to get back into authentic church life after a long absence? I feel intimidated after being gone for so long, especially since I barely even remember how mass and sacraments work. Thanks a bunch. Okay, um, this is a good question. Um, first of all, uh, the, the, the way to get back to mass is to go back to mass. I know it's, it's really hard the first time if you haven't been in years and years and years, because obviously you're elapsed and you're not in a state where you're ready to receive sacraments. So if you've had your first communion, obviously don't take communion, uh, yet. Uh, but here, here's the thing. Um, you're going to walk into a random church. You're going to sit down in, in, in the, the very piney, pine solely smelling pews. You're going to sing the hymnal uh, and you're going to celebrate the mass either in the front or the back. And no one's going to give you stares. No one's going to tell you to get lost. No one's going to call the police for the first time you go. Convince yourself that you're a total outsider. You've never been to church. Pretend that you're a pagan. Pretend that you're a Muslim. You're a tourist. And introduce yourself as such. If they come up and talk to you afterwards, that will, I guarantee you, that will take the pressure off you. Right? And then get to know the people and then talk about returning again for another Mass. Then, after you attend a few Masses, start preparing your confession. Because that's the next step. Uh, it, 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 I'm assuming here you've been properly catechized and gone through the sacraments as a child, so that it's, it's this is more or less the process of returning to the church, and you don't need some kind of RCIA process. But it, it helps a lot with this to kind of talk to people afterwards and see what they say. People will always welcome you in a church, especially, and they'll welcome you even more the more of an outsider you are. So as long as you're not like, well, this, you know, I was here when I was a kid and it's not like how I remember it, you know, that might, but, but generally speaking, it'll be very welcoming. Another thing is, ironically, the more conservative the church, probably the more welcoming they'll be. Uh, the more thick the community is, the more welcoming they'll be. Sometimes highly boomerous boomer churches, the people who show up afterwards to have like afterwards at the brunch or to talk to the priest outside, they're very cliquish. And and sometimes um you can um you can get a little bit of a cold shoulder there, not because they don't like you, but because they're trying to monopolize the priest's time and because this is a dying parish, uh it, it, it you know, it's a bunch of um older people who are trying to get validated by by the the priest and, and there's not as much attention to integrating the outsider. Uh, but but even if you do kind of get the cold shoulder, believe me, everyone wants you there in the pews. Everyone does. It's a process. Convince yourself that uh, you know that it is a process. Attend mass as if it were just a concert. You know, in most cases in modern churches, probably a pretty bad concert in terms of the music. Although my wife does excellent uh, holy music, so. Uh, some some churches are very good, and then just work yourself through the process. It helps if you have a friend locally. It helps if you can make friends with the priest. It helps if there's someone else there, you know, your age that you can talk to and say hello to. Again, clicks oftentimes can occur, but most of the time people will welcome you. That's my experience. So I, I hope that helps, Tim Hoffman. I'm going to go to the next one. Nerve and V Maker for fifteen dollars USA. Do you think that the fiction is capable of inspiring people? I know many on the right think this, but I'm unaware of any great historical figures being inspired by fiction. I find it hard to be inspired by an outcome of an author artificially forced. Alfred the Great was inspiring because he was real. Well, I mean, I know. I mean, you're, you're tempting me to a really easy example. Uh, Alexander the Great... Uh, talked about I don't know I, I can't remember who I can't remember what historian said this but he he, he he was inspired in his heroic endeavors by the Iliad and so were the Greek philosophers who, who were using the Iliad and Homer as a basic text to to motivate their own philosophical questions uh, 
Now, arguably, I know that the counterpoint to this will be that, oh, well, you know, Alexander the Great thought that Achilles and Hector were actually historical people. Well, maybe. But they didn't believe in, like, the gods literally coming down from the heavens and fighting in the Trojan War. So they understood that there was a certain amount of archetypical uh, flourish, um, embezzlement to these pieces, and yet they were still inspired by them. Uh, when I think about um, World War II, uh, people were inspired by old cowboy movies like Roy Rogers and stuff like that. Uh, how many how many young children joined the military in World War II uh, watching earlier films about masculine heroism that were entirely fictional? Or reading books that were entirely fictional. Uh, fiction sets the boundaries for our existence in a real way. And th there have been more than enough people who've been, say, converted to Christianity by... I mean, a major step on my reconversion to Christianity was the brothers Karmazov and um, Dostoevsky, which is fiction. A lot of people report having a similar reaction to War and Peace, uh, and, and, and numerous people have been inspired. I mean, actually, mostly progressivists have been inspired. Early progressives were very inspired by, by, by pieces like War and Peace. Uh, I think fiction has an incredible power that, that we really underestimate. And not to mention things like fairy tales. Tolkien is, is a substrate um, for, for many people, sort of rediscovering an older mode of thought. And I don't know. I mean... Is it the same as, I mean, obviously the person who reads Tolkien and is really taken back by this old world, this old medieval world, they'll want to go back and study the lives of, of people like Joan of Arc or, um, or, or you know, the, the person you mentioned, Alfred the Great, or, or uh, St. Louis, or, uh, I don't know, King, King Richard the Lionhearted, or any, any number of these people. I list your medieval heroes here. Uh, they'll, they'll want to study the genuine article. But th does that mean that, that the, uh, the, the, the initial inspiration that came from fiction is immaterial? I, I would say absolutely not. But um, thank you for the super chat here. Wow, I'm going to have to... Uh, I only have an hour left. I can't believe I spent so much time on the, on the monologue. Okay. Uh, Five dollars from Medwords. Hi, Dave. Update on my philosophy class. Professors laying out the view that European colonization was intrinsically linked to scientific racism, and that these are different from pre-modern colonialism and racism because they essentialize race. Continued. Um, I guess I'll click on this one here. Uh, Europeans viewed the people they colonized as subhuman, which those people internalized. This being the progressive interpretation of white supremacy as uniquely oppressive systems, it does sound emotionally compelling in class. Although it's cathedral, it's a cathedral talking point. Your thoughts on the matter? Um. Well, I don't know what element you really want me to comment on. the The idea that some people are higher and some people are lower is not a product of of modernity it's a product of you can find it throughout the the ancient world you can find it throughout the medieval world and you know, if you want to look i mean one of the big villains in the progressive narrative is christopher columbus and i i think that there there's a, a few good youtube videos about how him being portrayed as sort of a, a genocidal maniac are kind of there's not a lot of historical basis around that. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of misattribution of historic crime when it comes to what was in an Española, um, which I think is modern day, modern day Dominican Republic slash Haiti. Um, but, but there was an open debate between people in the Catholic Church about how to treat uh, the, the native indigenous people there. And... People were, this was, you know, 100 years before the scientific revolution kicked off properly. And people were making the case that these people were lower people. They were like children. And you'll, you'll find similar things in like Aristotle and stuff like that. 
the 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 idea that the people you just conquered are lower people is just it's just I think a universal human trait. Uh, you'll you'll find you know Chinese saying the same thing about barbarians, and I'm sure the Mongols said the same thing about the people that they conquered and enslaved. Uh, the the idea that people internalized it and that this is white supremacy. I mean, I don't know that this is what's so ridiculous about this is the way I would confront this is just sort of modify this a little bit so okay so let's say like the, among the imperial powers of the 18th and 19th century one that could not be discounted was the ottoman empire they're one of the main contenders in the imperial struggle over the world maybe not one of the main contenders they were a, they were a waning power but they colonized a huge amount of the middle east and a huge amount of eastern europe including an area that my father's family comes from and they, they enslaved the hell out of it, and they subjugated the populations, and they used all sorts of racist explanations for why the Slavs and the Germans and whatnot were lower people who deserved to be enslaved, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so what? Is, is white slavery white supremacy? Is Japanese slavery of, of their prisoners white supremacy? Uh, you, you can keep on going like this. The, the, the arguments that your teacher is making aren't, they're not untrue. They're just half-truths. They, they lack sort of a unique, they, they're, the European process and colonization is being given a uniqueness that it doesn't deserve. I guess it was uniquely scientific in the later half of the, of the 19th century and the early half of the 20th century. But again, that was actually partially in its own decline. And the scientific dimension to the oppression didn't make it more oppressive or more brutal. In many ways, I think that the European colonists were less brutal than the colonists that directly had preceded them in the world, which were uh, sort of the Seljuk Turks, uh, the Mongols, uh, and and in India, um, what was it? The... Uh, the, the Muslim Empire in India, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on this right now. Um, you know, the, the people who built the Taj Mahal. Um, someone's going to correct me in this. Uh, in many ways, they were they were less brutal than those people. So, I don't know. I think that the, the, the your teacher, the perspective that comes out of these uh, the cathedral, is, is it's a fundamental ahistorical perspective on human political power, and one that's being done specifically to flatter the sensibilities of progressives themselves. And so uh, those are my thoughts on it. I guess, Medwards, I hope that helps. Uh, a lot of times, I don't know, a lot of times the, these, um, these perspectives are being, what, what they're expecting you to do is they're expecting you to go, no, uh, the, the European coloni colonists didn't do atrocities. Their morality was pure as the driven soul, as pure as the driven snow. They were they were just good old boys who, who made the world a better place and never did anything wrong. And the teacher can be like, ho, 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 why have this primary sort of strong that they, they did do something wrong? Your own 19-year-old, you know, college conservative, get to the back of the classroom. That, that's what they're kind of counting on because that's what they love doing. Uh, what, what they're not prepared for are are people with actually realistic views on politics who view all human history as brutal and who are willing to call up the ultimate naivete of their own progressive worldview and the brutality of their own progressive worldview, all the more brutal because it has to conduct itself under false pretense. And I don't know, I, I found that much more fruitful way. And these people, I, I don't know, again, as a 19-year-old, I did uh, make a fool out of myself when I came in contact with 28-year-old adjunct professors who, who liked uh, baiting conservatives into standard conservative talking points and smacking them down. Uh, but, but if I had been a little bit more self-aware and if I had had the wherewithal I have now, it would not be hard to humiliate these people at all. Uh, they have a number of talking points, some of which are demonstrably false, and all of whose framings are really transparently half-truths. If you can expose the falseness of their framing, then you can make them look stupid and not really hurt yourself much in the interim. But, but in all things, 
Look, guys, don't try to argue your professors out of their positions. Just be the eternal skeptic. Just be like, oh, I don't believe that. Be, be a cynic. Be a skeptic. Adopt a pure negative position when you're engaged with a powerful person. Because in all likelihood, you don't have the sophistication to argue against them. Maybe you're like a Nick Fuentes character. And for, for all his sins, Nick Fuentes is a, a good, he's a very intelligent person. He's very quick on his feet, and he's a damn good debater. And, you know, so if you're a Nick Fuentes 19-year-old, maybe you can get the drop on them. But for most people, you're going to get owned if you advance a positive position. But if you just shift into the negative, ask questions, be skeptical, and then constantly reframe, 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 refuse to accept the moral framework or or the sort of the factual framework that's being presented to you, or I should say the, the sort of the framework of... Um, I want to the questioning framework. That doesn't sound right. The, the framework of of um, how the questions are framed. If you if you constantly reject how the questions are framed and the moral framework of the conversation, uh, then you will be able to probably make a fool out of your professors, or at least not then you'll be able to engage in a more interesting conversation and learn more yourself along the way. The progressive responses to the conservative talking points don't need to be denied or ignored. They need to be integrated and they need to be confronted with political reality, not with an assertion of feel-good platitudes about how great the past was. The past wasn't great. The past was more human. The past was in many ways less uh, illusioned than their own world. The past created stronger people and people that if brought to our present age would lead the world in a more productive and, and, more, uh, and, and would lead humanity to more flourishing. But the past was not a pretty place. And, and to kind of respond with a conservative veneer or a conservative whitewash is exactly the kind of mistake that they're encouraging you to make. And you shouldn't make it. Reject the, fr reject the frame. Ask your own questions. And if you're really brave, maybe venture in um, if you have a good idea uh, what, what the fight's actually going to look like. But anyway... Uh, thank you for the super chat. Ben Y for $10. Is that being pinned? There we go. Hi, Dave. I was unable to resist my bug man tendencies and consumed a lot of Black Friday deals. Embarrassingly enough, this means that I'm no longer positive net worth. Well, it happens when you're young. Easy come, easy go, as they say, right? Uh, for me, uh, I think Black Friday and Christmas shopping is really... Uh, a power that my wife controls more than I do. I, I I just I just collect the super chats and work the job. She spends the money, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, but 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 I'm sorry to hear about your net worth, Ben White. Besides the tragedy of losing a pickup line, I've realized that I'm not too different from the consumers that I like to make fun of. Um, yeah, I mean we all have moments of weakness. I think in the in in. In, in late 2020, early 2021, I I may have uh, painted an army of Warhammer orcs. Uh, you know, now now that real world has engaged again, and and uh, I, I'm I, I'm I'm getting the politic bug again. Then uh, and 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 things are more opened up. Uh, that project's probably go go by the wayside. But we we all have our moments of weakness, uh, Ben White. So don't don't beat yourself up about it. The important thing is is uh, is to always kind of be cultivating the good elements in yourself. Uh, you, you'll have moments of weakness. I mean, having a moment of, of sin and having a moment of weakness or indulgence are two different. A, a moment of indulgence is uh, having a moment of sin or or moral weakness is one thing, and having a moment of indulgence is another one. Um, having an emo having a moment of moral weakness or sin is something that you really need to actively work on and try to actively obliterate because that seed will grow inside of you. Uh, having moments of sort of laziness or indulgence. Um, I mean, obviously indulgence and laziness are sins of a sort, uh, but they also tend to grow very slowly. And so the way you want to confront indulgence is to sort of constrain it, put it behind barriers, uh, delete Twitter from your phone. I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to have to do that because 
even being back for two weeks, I'm already feeling it get get me. My, I'm already feeling my mind get addicted to it uh, during moments when I shouldn't be looking at it. And the 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 way is to, to sort of create barriers around your own indulgence, create barriers around your own sloth. Uh, because um, let's be honest with ourselves, and you're, you're never going to be completely free of indulgence. You might be functionally free from larger moments of, of, of moral weakness. Like I don't think I, I mean, I used to have horrible problems with pornography, but I haven't had that problem in, in years and years and years, you know, in any, in any like serious capacity. And so, you know, you can actually attain functional victory over some sins, but, but, but lethargy and uh, indulgence in, in con- some consumer goods, I'm afraid. I've never, other than monks and people who have taken vows of poverty, the amount of separation you need to get total victory is sort of impossible. So I think the best you can do with these moments of indulgence is to kind of keep them locked behind doors, make sure that they don't expand past a certain point. And then when they get, um, when they get sort of to the, when they get past the line where it actually is a sin of some kind, then obviously try to confess it and, and find a way to do better. But that's my best advice, right? Um, American Covidiot. American Covidiot. Uh, I like that. Like, uh, a play on the, the Green Day at album, right? Uh, although, um, yeah, it kind of has too many syllables to be, to be really snappy, but I still like the name. American Covidiot for $10 USA. Hi, Dave. When it comes to Purple Caesar... How could he be moderate? Would not somebody who defeats the left need to be illiberal at the very least? Otherwise, he's just returning us back to the 90s. Perhaps this is what AA is after in his sensible centrist rebranding. Thanks, Dave. Well, yeah, I mean, okay, but what, what, how would AA, I mean, I agree with what you just said, but how would AA's uh, branding, uh, how, how would AA's reframing of it make that problem better or not worse? It makes it worse, right? But there can't be, I mean, there, there can be a, there can be a purple Caesar in that he appears to be purple, but there cannot be a spiritually purple Caesar. The, the, the Caesar will have to be at his core, a realist, which means at his core, a right winger. So he could have a blue veneer. He could be like, okay, well, like, the revolution has been completed. It's over now, guys. And now we're going to institute sexual socialism. And sexual socialism means you have to marry one woman for the rest of your life. The end. <laughs> That's the completion of the sexual revolution is sexual socialism, which is marry one woman until you, either you or her dies. And that, that, that is what all of the sexual revolution was building towards through all of its twists and turns. And, and that, you know, that would be what a, what a, what a purple Caesar would do. Uh, and it would be like, oh, yeah, revolutionary, revolutionary, revolutionary on the outside. Okay, it's basically just a right-wing idea, right? It's basically just destroying the revolution and then saying you fulfilled it. Like Napoleon did, like Stalin did, like Caesar did. It's the same process that occurs over and over again. And, and so, you know, there, there can't be, uh, there can't be the, this, this purple Caesar in, in, in a spiritual dimension, my my problem with the the sensible center from academic agent is that it like who, who is it who's the audience for this the, uh, the the audience is Adam and Sitch's audience the audience is Dev's audience uh, but it's not the mainstream because you're not going to get platformed by the mainstream and and furthermore again the people who you bring on board are going to be people who are shallow and who fall for frame games. And who always want to be seen as good people, which is exactly, you know, the fate of of the Rod Dreyers of this world. E- even if they do embrace uh, some kind of deeper roots moralism in theory, those deeper roots are theoretical. And what what was manifestly occurring every day in Rod Dreher's reality is sort of this this fluidic personality that hops from one freak out controversy to the next, and never has any solidity in in his behavior whatsoever. Um, so again, like, sure. I mean, look, look, you know, more and more, I think that what we need in, in our lexicon is an analogy for the tar baby or the poison pawn. I guess I'm not surprised why tar baby 
isn't used in the internet lexicon because it would almost certainly, it's from the Br'er Rabbit famous short story, the, the famous short, Br'er Rabbit short story, The Briar Patch. They catch Br'er Robert in this, uh, the tar baby. And the tar baby is something, the more you fight with it, uh, the deeper you fall into it, the more it catches you up. Uh, in the chess analogy, it would be a poison pawn. Like, I'm going to give you this free pawn. You don't get taken if you take it, but you have depositioned your pieces in a way that will allow me to take your queen in three moves or checkmate you in four moves or whatnot, right? And so so maybe Sargon of Akkad and academic agent are conceptualizing sensible centrism as sort of a trap. You know, the, the left will attack sensible centrism and they'll look bad doing it. Like, like and I don't mean the mainstream left because the mainstream left won't attack it. But maybe like maybe Bosch or BreadTube or uh, the, you know the El Chapo Trap House will will attack some uh, sensible centrism and you'll you'll be able to spring the trap. Or maybe Adam and Sitch will do it and you'll be able to spring the trap and you'll be able to get them into a fight that's not really a fight that y you'll win, but a fight that they'll lose. And when they lose, uh, you you will. Uh, get some power or some followers because they look very very weak and maybe those maybe among them will be somebody who's actually uh, you know very very um, uh, you know who's very very productive uh, and he just happens to be in those uh, sort of um, incredibly deceived intellectual spaces. Uh, what I I remember mentioning El Chapo Trap House it reminded me of this. Um, People people don't realize this. I don't think Rod Dreher realizes this, but Rod Dreher is like a major joke on the left. He has more people who know about him and read him on the left as a lol cow than I think he does people who read him and appreciate him on the right. He is a frequent uh, figure of humor uh, for for the El, for the El Cha, for the Chapo Trap House guys, and. I mean, I, I hope that if it ever happened to me, oops, one minute, guys. To... I hope that if that ever happened to me, sorry, <laughs> there's interruption there. I would hope that if I ever became a lol cow to the same degree, I would kind of have the self-awareness to process that and ask what I was actually doing to achieve that status, but why am I so popular as as a, as a punching bag for my enemies? Uh, think of a similar blogger with similar reach, Curtis Yarvin or Nick Land or Spandrel. Uh, nobody in El Chapo Trap House wants to use them as little cows because they, they can't they, they they can't make them funny. They can't make them a a, a, a fun punching bag. But anyway, American Covey video. I hope that answers your question. I'm going to move on to the next super chat. Pragmatic culture for $10 USA. Is it a victory? Sure. Is it one that allows us to seriously reframe the meta narrative of political discourse in the West? Absolutely not. AA needs some reality checks, especially before poo pooing the real system shock Fuentes and Ye have delivered. Well, I mean, have Ye and uh, Ye, for, for those uninitiated, is a, a contraction of Kanye West. It's his preferred nickname. He goes not by Kanye, but by Ye. Uh, how have Kanye and Nick Fuentes delivered a system shock to to the mainstream? I, I don't see how they've done that. They've given them the narrative that they want. The, this, the, the, the system wants a way to disqualify Trump from running in 2024, or they want him, they want a third party spoiler to come in and, and, and destroy everything. And yeah, and that's what they want. And Nick Fuentes and Kanye's antics this last week have made that objective easier to achieve, not harder to achieve. I don't know what productive role Nick can play in this environment. He's a brilliant debater. We all know that. He's a very intelligent young man. But and he can fill he can he can organize a conference. But I don't know how many second chances he's going to get platforming getting platforms from congress people if, he, if he's going to use those opportunities to 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 basically you know talk about mustache man and uh and uh mid-century germans which again i don't think he even believes in that stuff it's just a joke for him it's just a way to be edgy 
Anyway, um, thank you very much, Pragmatic Culture. Uh, I do agree. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, the kind of narrative shifting Twitter can do for the right wing is that they can expose uh, factual inaccuracies at the cathedral. So if there's another scandal that involves a question of fact, if somebody is caught lying, if, uh, if a piece of information about uh, a recent virus is discovered or a recent virus remedy is discovered, uh, that can now be given almost indefinite reach by Twitter. And this reach will only get larger and larger and larger as the right-wing networks reconstruct themselves. People don't realize this, but if you're a left-winger who has a very, very good tweet, you get way, 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 way more promotion uh, than a right-winger does. Uh, first of all, you, you get promotion because you are literally being boosted by the algorithm. You know, I, I got Vosh recommendations, even though I didn't follow him on Twitter or look up his tweets regularly. Uh, he was just trending in politics all the time. And, and that, that was just a leg up that he got from the algorithm, even though he had virtually nothing to say. And you got, so, you, so you, they got artificially boosted. But, but more than that, what they had was intact networks. They, A, they had mainstream leftists that would retweet radical leftists. But then again, also, because they weren't getting constantly centered, uh, they, they weren't getting constantly censored, the, their, their social network was intact. Uh, people, they, they had long tweet change where, where, where as soon as somebody retweeted something, all their more mainstream leftists would also retweet it. And, and I hypocrite covers this. The problem is, is that we're going to rebuild those networks for about a year. And then in a year, the cathedral is going to realize that these are hugely dangerous to its narrative construction. And it's going to find some way to get Elon Musk out of Twitter and get the managers back in. I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're going to try to find some way to do it. And <clears throat> and then, then you know, then, then the, the network you spent a year building is going to be gone by the end of the month. Um, and it's just what you've, it's just what you've essentially mainstreamed in that time. So, so I agree with you, pragmatic culture, and I'm going to go on. Um, the new GM, the new game master, uh, thanks for the answer last week, Dave. It cleared your point up for me. The last question on the city's subject, let's hope. Why move away from the power center when you've established yourself? Why not become a big fish in a small pond, then hop on to a bigger pond? P.S. I was 16 when I made the account. Forgive the DND reference. I when my when I was a kid, they used to call them DMs, not GMs. And I think DM got usurped by direct messaging, so they changed it. It was called Dungeon Master back in the day. But okay, uh, when I was 16. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, well, the, the problem with like just making it in city, like just flat out making it, is that the, the, the amount of people who get their start as sort of a young professional in cities, those that number can be very, very high. Because it's you can you can kind of cut your teeth on a professional career in the cities, get a lot of experience, learn the ropes. Uh, maybe meet a woman because it's, it's easy to meet people in cities. It's easy to meet a lot of people in cities, including women, especially if you're in a city like New York, with, which has a lot of women in it. Uh, it so, so there's that, right? Um, uh, but, but there are very, very few people that can, they can sort of make it in the way that you're talking about. The number of people who make it big to the point where they could afford having a middle-class existence with a large family in the center of the city is very, very, very small. And the opportunity costs, if you're not in some kind of weird ethnic enclave, go up and up and up and up and up as you start having kids. Uh, the amount, I'm living in sort of a blue exurb of a major metropolitan area. And even in this exurb, the costs are astronomical and they only get higher as you go closer in. And I'm not, I'm like, I'm not the most successful guy in the world, but I'm certainly not a failure. And, uh, and, 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 you know, so have I made it enough? Certainly not like Musk has, certainly not, 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 not like the people who can have nine children and live in downtown San Francisco. That's impossible. So that, that's more or less my perspective. Thank you very much, uh, GM. 
on to Oliver Ryan for $10 USA. Hi, Dave. I've been watching you since Bioshock, my Bioshock video. You and the Franklin are great. Keep it up and God bless. Well, thank you very much, Oliver Ryan. Your, uh, your super chat is well, very well appreciated. And uh, the brevity means that I might be able to get to bed on time tonight. Apollo Too Good for $3 USA. Is Hurdy Gurdy the instrument of the sensible center? Um, <laughs> Hurdy Gurdy. I'm going to look this up. I, my folk roots are failing me, guys. I've forgotten what a Hurdy Gurdy is. Oh, yeah, that thing. Um, the Hurdy Gurdy. Is it the instrument of the sensible center? Um, I don't know. I, I think that maybe, maybe people should bring back playing the saw. The saw is an underrated instrument. It's uh, it sounds bizarre, but it you know with other strings it has a certain charm to it, doesn't it? it has a certain pair it with a cello and a fiddle and a banjo and you've got a band. Why why can't the saw be the sensible center? The saw cuts in the center. It cuts things down the center. So there's sort of that symbolic dimension to it. But thank you very very thank you very much. And I'm going to go on to the next one here. Aphelion Multimedia for $20 USA. No questions for me tonight, just shoveling my, showing my support and appreciation. Well, thank you very much, Aphelion Multimedia. Oh, by the way, guys, I published a video. Uh, this is another thing I wanted to mention here. I published a video uh, last night, or was it the night before last? Whatever. Uh, I published a video, 40, 40 lessons from Warhammer 40K. And really, it wasn't a serious video, and I probably shouldn't have made it. And it, and it's definitely, I probably won't be making videos like that ever again. But it was really more just a thought experiment, because first of all, it started out, I, I promised this video. I promised a video on Warhammer 40K. And so I had to make one. And I, I'm not, I, it was easy for me, so I did it, right? Um, the harder to fulfill promises, I don't know if I can always uh, fill those in a timely manner. Um, uh, but it was going to be a tweet thread and I turned it into a video, but it was also an experiment on the YouTube outro because if I had released a top 10 list of video about a nerd culture franchise in 2017, that video would have exploded. It would have been a huge video. It would have gotten like 30,000 views, maybe a hundred thousand easy. In 2022, a political video about a nerd culture franchise it's going to do a little bit worse than this live stream. And it took probably about eight times the amount of time to make. So, uh, you know, that's why you're probably not going to get more videos like that. I think Academic Agent is right. Videos are, are sort of signposts. They're when you have an idea and you want to share that idea. Boom. Like, this is my new idea that I'm trying to mainstream into the conversation. Uh, it's not for sort of just ruminations or for nice little kind of clickbaity fun time info information or or, or little lessons re encapsulations of political lessons in the language of warhammer 40k as my video was iron duke 99 for three dollars usa i don't know milo or fuentes who decided to sabotage i don't know if it was milo or fuentes who decided to sabotage trump but fuentes ain't stupid enough not to know what's going on uh, yeah, I mean, though Iron Duke, ultimately, it's not going to make a difference. I don't think anyone's going to remember this in like a month. And the election for Trump is a long way away. And I don't think that Kanye West is going to be large enough to be a spoiler. I don't think Milo and Nick can pull it off. But it was a, it was a macrocosmic uh, loss for the right. And the only people who won were the people who were trying to generate short-term clout for themselves, namely Myelinopoulos and Nick Fuentes. And I mean, yeah, that's really a great symbol when your leaders prefer short-term clout over long-term political gain, uh, even though I think that the, 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 the long-term impact is probably going to be pretty minimal. Um, so, so is the clout, but you know that that's where these people are, and I don't know what to say about these people. I I, I frankly don't even understand why people um, think so highly of them, <laughs> but but I can't argue. Do not argue with the logic of Zoomers for there lies madness, people. To car for three dollars USA. What does the Catholic, what does the cathedral wish young men thought about, uh, thought and aspired to? 
What does the cathedral wish young men thought and aspire to? Well, that's obvious. Uh, the, 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 the ideal version of the young white man, or the young man generally, has already been bestowed to us in this blessed year of our Lord, 2022. And the apex, the pinnacle of the cathedral's idea of what a young white man should be is Sam Bankman Freed. What do you do? You get a degree from an Ivy League institution. You completely embrace the ideology of progressivism. You eat gross food, have a polycule, get egregiously fat, uh, earn billions of dollars, and take performance-enhancing drugs that will destroy your mind and your ability to examine things critically. Defraud investors out of billions, uh, my, investors who are trying to cash in on crypto, and then give all the money you earned back to the powers that be, back to the cathedral itself. Sam Bankman Freed basically speed ran the ideal life trajectory that, that, the, that the mainstream envisions for young men. Live gross, die young, make a beautiful corpse of a company with lots of liquid capital that can all be bequeathed back to the powers that be to keep the cycle going on for one more generation, guys. That's the vision. And um, if you can't live up to the majesty of Sam Bankman Freed, or you know, you, you think that that might not be the most uh, that might not be the most rewarding or the most edifying fate of a young man, then I'm afraid you're a thought criminal and you're a racist. That's racist. It's racist not to want that, guys. Uh, and, and Rod Dreher probably is here to tell you that uh, if you object to that too colorfully, uh, you know, we, we, need to, we need to have an anti-white supremacy inquisition uh, destroy all, all of our uh, alternative Benedict op option institutions that might push back against that narrative. But, but there you go. Thank you very much, Dakar, and I'm going to be going on to the next one. <coughs> Creeper Weirdo for $5 USA. I get what academic agent is trying to do. Still, for me, I don't want to be sensibly centrist. I want to be a red America, a traditional American with a deeply religious... I want a red America, a traditional America, and a deeply religious America. Centrism now seems like we're just giving up on the community we are building. I mean, also, just it's just not what we are. We are people who are radically out of sync with what the mainstream says. It's obvious we're out of sync with what the mainstream says. We should wear that as a point of pride. And I, I'm never going to call myself a centrist. What's the point in that? I'm obviously not. I'm obviously not a centrist. I'm obviously not a mainstream person. And I don't know. I mean, again, I I I, I try to think of the person who's going to be. I understand the people who might be able to be baited into a, 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 a debate with sensible centrism. I don't understand the person who's going to be genuinely wooed by it or who's going to find that genuinely compelling. So I, uh, I, I, I can't say I, I'm very impressed by it myself, but maybe it'll be a giant tar baby for the left and they'll, they'll just uh, they'll twist themselves in knots trying to digest a, a sensible centrism. All right, uh, Travis for $3 USA. The Senate has passed the new same-sex marriage bill, and there are fears that it will give further a substantive basis against religious groups. What are your thoughts on the future of this matter? Um, well, I, I would assume that they're going to pass, that they're, they're going to pass this um, bill. They're going to pass as many bills as they want. And they're going to take religious institutions to court over the problem of gay marriage. And I think that for the time being, they'll probably lose in the courts. Uh, but if they don't lose, then just refuse to participate, refuse to participate in anything involving uh, this LGBTQ stuff. And, you know, if, it, if it's illegal in your country to protest against it, just walk away. Don't give any effort towards this stuff. 
it, 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 it's, it's a useless waste of human potential. And every time that you participate in something that involves it, you're wasting your own life. And you're degrading yourself from participating in it. So you have to walk away from the fake and the gay at all times. And, uh, and, and th there will be other people who do the exact same thing because this stuff is transparently soulless. And forcing it down religious institutions' throats is going to be... I think it'll be a moment of truth. I really do. We just can't... As Christians, we cannot be led by people like Rod Dreher anymore. I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. It's just... What what the hell are you supposed to do with this stuff? It, you know, let, let's, let's purge the community we created for for progressivism's leftover ideology. I mean, that's, that's where the mainstream Christian leadership of the 90s has gotten us. And uh, there's, there's going to have to be a changing of the guard at some stage. And I, I don't know who's actually willing to do this, who's actually willing to stand up. And I wish I knew more people who were, uh, who were, who were on the same page. And there are a few of them here and there. But the only people who remain will be those people. We, we can't rely on legislation not being passed. This is one reason why living in a blue area is can be helpful sometimes, at least temporarily, is that it kind of it kind of teaches you modes of living uh, that are inside an area where progressives are already victorious. And as such, you kind of build up an immunity to it. I find once once you're firm in your beliefs and you're 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 in you're, you're in contact with other people who are firm in their beliefs, you build up an immunity to this progressivism bullshit, and and you're able to go your own way and function inside the larger uh, larger apparatus more or less unharassed. If you play your cards right, but I hope that answers your question, Travis. Um, I'm gonna go on because I've got a lot of super chats. How am I not halfway through them already? I don't know because I'm already coming up on time. Promatic culture for $5 USA. Nick loves Trump and has affirmed so several times. If you or others want to GQ post about a PSYOP or supposed smear job, so be it. Um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, pragmatic culture. Uh, wasn't, um, aren't, isn't, isn't that group, after meeting with Trump, now proposing a third-party run for Kanye in 2024? Was that not part... I mean, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm wrong about this. I apologize if that's misinformation. I kind of have been not paying attention to this a lot. But uh, if they're running against Trump, they're not supporting him. And, and maybe Nick Fuentes loves Trump, but why, why are... If you love Trump, then why are you putting him in a room with somebody who is currently incredibly toxic for most mainstream appeal. I mean, this isn't, is I mean, Trump isn't an intellectual. Trump isn't supposed to be creating the Benedict option here. He, he's not trying to forge a separate intellectual space. He's trying to get votes and to, to create a big photo op where he's with, you know, th three figures who are entirely hated by the mainstream I don't see how that helps Trump at all. Uh, what what did it get Trump? For from it seems like nothing as far as I can figure out. I know it have lost him. Cultist of Shib Niggerass, yes, the black goat of the wood with a thousand young. For me, the introduction of the pri uh, Primaris Marines m marked the beginning of the end of Warhammer 40k. Well, that is absolutely the case. Yeah, I mean, the, the prim, uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, Warhammer 40K is a... Uh, it, it depicts a technological dark age that's gone on for 10,000 years. And at some point, they because they wanted to sell more miniature games, Games Workshop decided to create a plot point where there actually was a technology increase inside the Imperium which completely subverts the entire premise of the universe. If technology can be invented in Warhammer 40K that is superior to the technology at the beginning of the Dark Age, then they're no longer in a technological Dark Age. They're in some kind of weird renaissance, which means that the entire 
uh, feeling of the universe is somehow off kilter. Uh, now technology comes online as a solution to problems as as opposed to being part of the narrative constraint itself. And so the, the Primaris Marines uh, subverted a core element of, of, of the setting. It would be like as if in Lord of the Rings they invent guns and gunpowder. So that at the Battle of the Black Gate, they, they have this incredible advantage over Mordor because they've got lines of musketeers. Uh, sure, that's an interesting historical novel, and it might make a good historical fiction if you're telling me a story about the Third Year's War or about the, the, the warring states in Japan. But as an element of magical fantasy, that plot point of element doesn't make much sense. So I agree with you there, cultist, but I'm going to go on because I want to keep good time here. Uh, maybe this should be the end of the Super Chats, guys. <laughs> I do appreciate it, but thank you very much. Uh, to Car for $3 USA, why do you think there are almost no elites on our side of things? Even, um, <clears throat> even on uncontroversial things, using their own money to make based art, etc. Okay, this is an easy one. Uh, yeah, easy answer to this one. Okay, so this is an ole So what we're dealing with is an oligarchy, right? So the oligarchy is in power because it ha so oligarchy is ruled by the many, and, and the oligarchy is in power because they all have the same ideology, and they all hire each other with the same ideology. And uh, the the thing is, is that uh, the way the way this works is. The combine only stays in power if everyone plays by the combine's rules. If anyone breaks them, the combine starts losing power, and everyone in the oligarchy will lose their power. And so the, the only way to keep it is to sort of police the boundaries, which means that if there is any millionaire uh, who, like, not, not like a billionaire, but if there's any sort of ordinary, reasonably rich person who, ha who had a series of small businesses who said that they wanted to sort of start start being a prominent sponsor to America First or to the Old Glory Club or what have you, uh, the rest of the oligarchy would immediately come down on that person like a ton of bricks for, for, for their thought crime because their breaking rank would threaten the power structure of the rest of the oligarchy. So the only way you can beat this is to either fly below the radar, be an anonymous blogger online, or be an independent business person that has, you know, that's that th their their interests aren't connected to to the main to the mainstream. Or you can fly above the radar like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, where you're you're just so successful that you have fuck you not not only do you have fuck you money, you have fuck you capital. So your money keeps on rolling in regardless of what the press thinks. So you, so that's the reason why there are no elites is because if, if there were conservative elites, they would have lost their position by now. Originally in the 1990s, the reason why there were no conservative elites was that there were the, the conservative movement, uh, the, the, the colleges went hard left and opportunities are drying up for conservatives in liberal arts because it had become entirely ideological and the conservative movement had relied up until that point to, to farm a, a sort of separate intellectual space and not a completely equal one to the left but but somewhat equivalent right uh, there, there would be like lots of conservatives coming out there would be you know, conservatives would there would be like 30 percent of the staff would be conservative at, at a given university and then in the 90s it went from 30 to one and then to almost zero now. And, um, and, and uh, so, so in the 90s and in the 2000s, it was a question of pipeline. At this stage, it's a question that the, the, the actively purge, the oligarchy actively purges thought criminals because thought criminals are, 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 make the entire combine's political formula not work anymore. Because if you can break rank with a narrative, why can't everyone break rank with a narrative? And pretty soon we don't have a narrative anymore. And pretty soon everyone's just fighting for their own beliefs. And that means that they're no longer an oligarchy anymore. And the entire thing collapses. So the, the interdependence of economic relations is what made this sort of a possibility. 
And then the relative ability of progressivism to outcompete and monopolize the public space is what made the situation uh, essentially essential to how the modern world functions. But thank you for your question, Dakar, and I'm going to go on. Uh, Talios Hammerfist for $100 USA. Wow. Hello, Dave. Thank you for always giving a unique and honest perspective on issues of our day. Do you believe punching right is inappropriate or to be avoided? If so, how do you distinguish between when to punch right and when to distance and separate from a position or entity? Excellent question. Excellent, excellent, excellent question. And I've answered this many times. It's excellent because I got an answer for this one. But I mean, okay, so I mean, we can take the example of, of um, what was that guy? Uh, Thomas Accord. Uh, well, the whole Rod Dreher uh, controversy erupted over this week. Thomas Accord did something that was definitively wrong. He did not conduct himself in a civilized manner or with the the reservations we would ordinarily ask uh, of a Christian gentleman, right? He, he did not conduct himself in, in, in a manner befitting a Christian gentleman. That is wrong. The way you deal with this is twofold first of all well first let's 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 get the background the the, the bat why do we say don't punch right we do, we, say, we say we don't punch right because there is a leftist superstructure that is actively subverting our attempts to organize and uh the it's actively uh, uh, subverting our attempts to organize and, and to be separate from it uh and they're using ideological purity as a tool against us uh, even, even when there might be reason to agree with them on some ethical points, they will use that. For instance, it's bad to be a bigot. It's a bad to hold some. It's bad to hold an individual's background against them, in, in in the context where you're dealing with them as men, as individuals, as equal moral actors uh, in, in some corporation or some workplace or some religious environment. You judge the character, not their ethnic background. Uh, and that's not to say that collective evaluation is entirely useless or that you shouldn't care about your people or that peoples don't deserve to have homelands or there can't be questions about demographics that we answer statistically but but bigotry is bad right mm -hmm. and christians will say this christians at all times will have said this that that you need to judge the, the moral worth of a man and and not just the, the pedigree of of some other ex exogenous element of him but, but this injunction against bigotry has been used to bend and break Christian institutions and to essentially uh, expand the power of, of the mainstream and the cathedral, as I like to call it. And, and you can see so clearly in Rod Dreher's case, he's the pawn of the cathedral because he's telling all of his Christian friends that what Christians really need is to have an anti-white supremacy witch hunt. And who's training the anti-white supremacy witch hunters? Well, of course, it's the cathedral. They've been training anti-white supremacy witch hunters for 20 years now, and they're just, they're just chomping at the bit for a job. Oh, well, sure, they'll take, they'll, they'll, they'll take a job as, as, the, as the human rights commissar for your Christian college, and then they'll drive it into the ground. So the, the problem it literally is, Talos, is that you've got a bunch of bad faith actors that are using good arguments for bad ends. And because of that, what, what people need to do is they need to take moral responsibility in two ways. The first way you do this is that you have to handle these matters internally. If you are, because so if it's a crime, like it's against the law, that someone gets murdered or raped or, or sexually abused, like that needs to go to the law because there's not cur I mean there's not currently a situation where murderers aren't tried for murder or where uh, or where um, you know child rapists aren't being prosecuted not yet at least right so so that that goes that needs to go to the authorities as part of your fiduciary duty to the state the state enacts just laws you cooperate with those just laws. And to my knowledge, it hasn't legalized a rape or murder yet, except in the case of abortion, which is a different case. So in those strictly illegal circumstances, you know, obviously you go to the law there. But when it comes to other moral transgressions, you need to handle, and, and these moral transgressions, they, they, if, they, if they intersect with a, a, an avenue of subversion, you need to handle them internally. And you need to handle them with as little drama as you possibly can. 
preferably privately. If there needs to be an apology, it needs to go to the actual people who are harmed. If there needs to be a public apology, it needs to be heard by the offended public and not by the general public. You know, we don't we don't send these these apologies with a punish me uh, sticker to the New York Times asking them to come and do an expose on the failure of this one pastor, you know, who, who had an affair with a student or something, a, a you know, failure affair with an adult student or something like that, right? Uh, like we we don't we don't we don't in, but but what we still punish and we ask for repentance and we ask for justice. The second thing is, and this is I think more important than kind of dealing with this at the appropriate level, is dealing with dealing with it in the appropriate language. Uh, I had this list, this this Twitter thread that I probably should have used as my experiment of turning Twitter threads into videos, other than rather than the Warhammer 40k video. I had this uh, Twitter thread called. Um, how do I identify friends or friends as they're called, which means an online friend, friend with no, um, uh, just F R E N S, um, friends. And, and one of the things I say in, in that tweet thread is, uh, friends do not hop on cancellation bandwagons. So if people are going after Nick Fuentes for white supremacy or racism, I have been a critic of a lot of racialized right-wing politics, but I'm not going to attack Nick Fuentes for being a racist or white supremacist. I'll say something like, he puts too much of an emphasis on race. Or that one time, he, he, was, he was bigoted towards that one... Per- I don't know if he ever was bigoted towards a person. As far as I'm aware, Nick Fuentes' uh, attitudes are entirely performative and entirely on social, me- social media. But, but I would say something like, that's conduct unbefitting a Christian gentleman. If he was rude, I would say that's bigot, that, 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 that exhibits a certain bigoted attitude. If, it's, if, it's, um, if he's actually being unfair or cruel to a, an individual based on a background. But I do not use the language of the progressive cathedral. I don't say white supremacy. I don't say racism. I don't say fascism. Uh, these are magical made-up words that are there to trigger their political apparatus and expand their power in your institutions. So you have to not use the progressive and spell, smell. I'll still object to the behavior. I'll still ask for justice, the fullest justice we can possibly get. I'm not, exi- I'm not exonerating anyone from a moral standard here. But when, when I ask for justice and I, I ask for accountability, I'm not going to do so in the language of the left. And, and I think that is sufficient to, to not punch right. You know, don't, don't, it's okay to criticize people for things, but, but don't do so in, 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 with the progressive ant smell on you. And, and don't try to get political clout for, don't try to get brownie points from the left when you're doing it. Because when I, when I read Rod Draher saying that, the, 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 that all Christians now need to have a giant soul searching about white supremacy, do I really think that he's not saying that loudly so it can be heard by progressives and so he can get a pat on the head for that? It uh, really, I, I don't believe that for a second. It it feels like you're throwing your community under under the bus for purposes of making yourself more palatable to a mainstream audience, and that's the kind of the the betrayal aspect of it is what is what we 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 need to avoid. We need to avoid people betraying each other and subverting the institution from within. If you have a conflict with another right winger, uh, pursue your conflict like gentlemen. Out in the open, explicit disagreement, and never using the language or the subversive nature of the left to communicate your disagreement or to resolve it. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to go on to the next one. Thank you for the very, very generous super chat. I hope that was a sufficient answer for $100. Um, RB for $5 USA. Between the BAP sphere reducing itself to nothing but reacting to assorted Fuentes drama, an academic agent churning out embarrassing nonsense like this and the dissident right doesn't exist, I'm glad this corner of things has stayed relatively sane. Well, I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, RB, I'm I'm still good friends with the academic agent. He's a great guy. I, I'm, I don't know Bronze Age pervert. I liked his book. I mean, it was it was a little silly. I'm not gonna lie. It, it felt like reading a modernized version of of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, uh, written by a 4chan troll. 
Uh, but but I appreciated it in the spirit in which it was given, and with the and with the necessary amount of irony and insight in which it was given. And because of that, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, I don't want to discard these guys from the friend. They're absolutely part of it. And an and academic agent has done great work. Carl, I mean, Carl Bent, Sargon of Akkad has done great work, uh, you know, in, in very different capacities. In, in many ways, I would say, uh, people always, everyone knows that Carl is good at something, but, but it's very hard to put your finger exactly in what, I mean, he has survived for a long time and reinvented himself a lot. And so everyone knows he's probably good at something, but no one can ever put their finger on what it is. But but it, it always seems that um, academic agent is is bad at the things that Carl Benjamin is good at. <laughs> um, you know, academic agent when he when he wants to troll people, he uh, he kind of he sometimes can make it a little bit too personal. And when Sargon trolls people, there's always sort of a jovial nature to it that uh, that. It, first of all, it kind of makes it it kind of makes it so that the, the, that Sargon's ideas can explode and they never seem to really hurt him. Uh, he always kind of walks away from them like, oh, that was a bad idea. On to the next idea, right? Maybe the next idea is a better idea. So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, Sargon's a great guy. Academic Agent's a great guy. Uh, and, you know, they're part of the community. I think this particular idea is a bad one. And you know, speaking of the distant right, I really disagree with this constant relabeling of ourselves. A year ago, everyone used the word distant right, and everyone knew that it was basically just a negative label. And then 12 months later, you had two sides of the same argument, denouncing the alt-right, thinking uh, sorry, denouncing the distant right, thinking that the, that the distant right was the other side of the equation. And, and that's like, Peak Twitter spurgery, in my opinion. But there you go. Thank you very much for the super chat. On to the next one. Takara for $5 USA. Are you slash can you be friends with people that work within, benefit from, and do not see a major problem with the cathedral? Progress was good until five minutes ago types. Um, well, I mean, of course I can be friends with them. I mean, that's most of my <laughs> real life friends are like that. Uh uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking like that's um, the only people I can't be friends with are people who I think are going to betray me. And the one good thing about the, 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 the back to the 90s, back to Fresh Prince people, is that they might be completely deluded about the nature of the conflict we face, uh, but they are people who have been betrayed by the cathedral. And so they're not in the market to throw you under the bus. Although Rod Dreher might have proved me wrong on that front. And... I, I don't know if I can really uh, guarantee it, but I, I find moderate liberals to be quite pleasant people to be around. And in the end, I'm not. Uh, in the end, sort of the center of the road people start move. In my experience, they start moving in in my direction more than I move in theirs. Uh, mostly because their centrism is a product of them not having asked very deep questions, but but their their refusal of progressivism indicates that they have the right instincts for the most part all right um and, and also they have the right values that's ultimately what's behind it right because the, the difference between progressives and uh non-progressives is a difference in value not in a difference uh of uh of um of um of of, of fact okay i need to go faster because i'm losing my voice um uh, ben White, $5 USA. It's amusing watching the lefties cheer on the lockdown protesters in China. Oh, yeah, that's hilarious. And now it's uh, and now it just shows democratic spirit. It's like they've selectively forgotten how they treated COVID protesters in the West two years ago. It's not hypocrisy. It's hierarchy. Two years ago, how they treated COVID protesters one year ago. It hasn't even been a cotton pick in 11 months since they denounced COVID protesters as dangerous super spreaders. Uh, the, the amount of cognitive dissonance uh, on this whole China lockdown thing is absolutely amazing. It leads me to believe that the cathedral is more vulnerable than it lets on. Obviously, this Ukraine fiasco with Russia, it, it, it appears that you know the cathedral, the State Department, is actually going to pull a win out of the fire here in all likelihood 
And, and so what we're going to experience for the next period of time is not the decline of America, but rather turbo America. Uh, America at the height of its power, just as it reaches the low point of its own competence. And what emerges out of that is going to be very, very fun to witness. But, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I can't, I, I, Ben White, I totally agree with you. I, uh, what, how does this, this is, this is one of the reasons why the leftists can't handle dialectics anymore, is that there is just no ability to, to process, unless they completely control the framing of all debates, the cognitive dissonance just becomes so clear at every level that it's impossible to embrace anymore. And, and so we're in the position we are right now. I mean, uh, sure, you know, twi maybe can Twitter, can you do discourse on Twitter? Can you do dialectic on Twitter? I don't think so. But, but if, if, if you could, like if, you, if Twitter could lead to that the way it did in 2016, it would be a major blow against the mainstream media and the mainstream narrative. All right, next super chat. Central Academic Agency for $3 USA. Hello, Dave. So when are you going to rebrand as the sensible Christian? Oh, oh, God, that, that sounds like the, that, that sounds like straight from the winsome handbook of, of 1990s evangelical Christians. I, I really don't want to throw evangelical Christians under the bus. I feel like I'm constantly just, what do you call the people who do this though? What, what do you call this kind of, of, uh, this very, this, this very prominent, very specific culture of Christianity that, that, le that lives in the margins of blue America and mainly in red America. It's everywhere, and I don't know what to call it other than evangelical. But yeah, uh, when are you going to rebrand to the sensible Christian? You can go around and tell all the other Christians and explain it to them. But before you do, uh, you have to hurl insults at them first. <laughs> uh well, we really are taking a playbook out of Academic Agent's Twitter account here. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't advise uh, be, uh, copying uh, Roll and Rat for how to conduct yourself in a Christian community. I don't think it would play very well. I think you'd have some problems there. So uh, keep that in mind. The sensible Christian. Ugh, good Lord. But thank you very much, Central Academic Agency. I'm going to go on here. <clears throat> to Carr for $5 USA. I wanted to ask you 10 more questions, but I'll have to leave it at that and say thank you. I benefit enormously from your insight and your back catalog has aged like fine wine. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully I'm making more edited videos soon, but unfortunately I've exhausted my vacation. I always like use my vacation to like write more essays that I can publish later. Uh, because most of the time I, I really get my, um, my insights for writing at like 11 AM, which I'm at work then. <laughs> so, you know, I have like this, uh, notepad I, I, I scroll down ideas on, but you know, that, that's like, you know, that you can't write, you can't write Substack essays that way. And this year I lost almost all my vacation time to COVID. Um, but, but, you know, maybe I'll have some time over the holidays, uh, to, to do more work on that and I'll publish a video or two that actually has some substance behind it unlike the purely fun Warhammer 40k one but thank you very much to Carr um, the night is growing late so I'm going to keep on going here five dollars from Iron Duke I love your streams and your intellectual takes but while there are many good Catholics Protestants Orthodox and even pagans and agnostics there are also many bad people from those groups am I wrong yeah, yeah, and this whole Rod Draher thing, I found it much easier now to process paganism. From now on, I'm going to just conceptualize all paganism as being an overreaction to the existence of people like Rod Draher and David French. That, that's how I'm going to imagine their thought process. And since I don't have to process it like an actual serious religion, I think I'm going to be a lot more charitable to that group from now on. Because I don't actually have to think of it like it's a rival idolatrous religion. I can just think of it like an emotional overreaction to to to, to weak Christian leadership. And um, well, I I hundred percent agree with you, Iron Duke, that there are bad people from all of those groups. The problem of the modern world seems to be that all of the best people are subordinate, and all of the really strong good people are in positions where they can't do. Uh, all, sorry, all, sorry, all, all the good people are subordinate and all the bad people are in positions of authority. 
all the people in authority are either cooperating with this insane mainstream uh, agenda, this this insane mainstream vision of the future that's being unrolled before us, or or they're too weak to push back against it, and and they're and they're bending a knee, either out of cowardice or out of uh, laziness, uh, or 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 they're just sort of trying to uh, watch the world burn because it's entertaining. Yeah, that's a good that's a good observation, Aaron Duke. I. Don't have anything to add to it, especially at this hour of the night. Chad Pilgrim for three dollars USA. Hey Dave, have your interactions gone? How how have your interactions gone with left casts? They seem to be obsessed with the idea of Catholic social teaching, uh, and it means it means joining the DSA, and that's that is essential sen- sensible political solution somehow. Um. <clears throat> well, I I feel. I mean, to be honest, left cast. I haven't talked seriously to left casts uh, since two thousand and eighteen. I think. I, I mean, I, I w- I've been part of many. I, I've been a part of many parishes. I've moved around a lot since two thousand and eighteen, a lot. And I've been. I, my home parishes have been weak and strong accordingly. But there's been one consistent dimension to them, and that is that left wing Catholics do not talk to right wingers. They never talk to us. In real life, and they stopped talking to us online back in 2017. I feel definitively that I have got the left cath, uh, the the left cat. Let's just say left wing Catholics. I've got the left wing Catholics number. Fine, I'll join DSA. Who cares? The distinction between socialism and capitalism is meaningless anyway. Just you, the though, if you are taking social teaching seriously. If you're so into this stuff, if you're if you're, sh- if you're so into the seamless garment, then I want an absolute statement that abortion is murder, that marriage is between a man and a woman, that children deserve having a, both a mother and a father if it's available to them, and, and that the human race uh, cannot be sublimated to, to to larger desires of secular social justice, which are obviously and transparently linked to doing the exact things. To make the world easier to rule from the perspective of NGOs and corporate America. So join the DSA, put on the the workers, the Catholic workers of the world unite t-shirt, talk about Dorothy Day. Hell, I'll give you a few books on distributism if you want to read them. A lot of those guys got sucked into movements uh, that were mid-century Italian in character or mid-century Spanish in character. So maybe your left-wing sensibilities aren't going to like those guys so much. Uh, but you'll learn a lot. But show me that you're loyal to the moral vision of the church. And show me you've got a backbone to stand up to modernity. If you're bending a knee to the mainstream secular order that is basically destroying our world at the stage and covering up and lying, I really don't have time for you. I mean... I. I mean, I, have, I, I do have time for you as a fellow believer. I, I, I care deeply about your about your soul and your, your my brother in Christ and all that stuff. But I, I really don't think I can help you at a political dimension. Uh, I, I don't think that that um, I, I will I'll pray for you. I'll, 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 but I don't know what, what what do you want? You've you've got the mainstream in your corner. You're 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 going along with power, and I'm not gonna indulge the 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 fiction the larp that, that you're somehow a revolutionary and i think you know if you if, if that's the frame you approach left-wing catholics with uh what, what do they say to that they they say nothing they, they ask for and i'm not going to denounce friends either right if if you have one if one if one of my friends said something that you think is racist you know, I'll talk with them about it. We can talk about the proper principles, you know, uh, and and certainly, you know, and we can talk about what, what the appropriate response is. But but I'm not going to publicly denounce people for 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 sort of imaginary thought crimes or, or things that you imagine they might have meant by by spicy statements made online. Because time after time after time, what I've seen as people being baited into character assassination due to things that are obviously out of context or were said in a moment of passion and not really meant in the way that they were meant. 
And reputations are ruined because of this. And I'm not playing the game anymore. I, I, I will assert that all human beings are of equal moral worth. All humans have a right to their own country where they're respected. Not necessarily their own nation, because I think that's impossible. But they, but they all have a minimal right to determine the course of their culture and their proper stewardship of morality and good governments inside their own community in an ordered and godly fashion. And in the pursuit of that, I will defend the dignity of all people. But that's where the conversation really ends. Unless you can come up with something more substantive than a witch hunt, which is all they have to offer at this stage. All right. Sean Horton for $10 USA. You have said just last week, I believe, that Christians are years behind the curve and respond to the present as if it were five to ten years ago. Why? I agree, but I don't understand the cause. Uh, it's locational. It's because uh, they they don't... the. And it's not all Christians. Like, if you go to urban areas, like Orthodox Christians, because they come from urban areas, tend to be a little bit more with it. They understand that, that, that they understand what the game is because they're from urban areas. And Catholics, to a like young Catholic communities, tend to be more aware of these things as well. Uh, but, but really, the, the, the problem lies is that the base of their political support is in Red America. Now, I want to emphasize this because it was misunderstood last time. I prefer Red America to Blue America. I feel like Rep Butler from that famous scene in Gone with the Wind, where they're all prepared. Fort Sumter is just about to be attacked, and they're all discussing the possibility of entering a civil war against the North. And Rep Butler is saying, like, you guys are going to get tooled by the Union because they've got, like, five times as many guys as you do and 20 times as much industrial capacity as you do and you've got no chance. And the Southerner is like, are you saying that a Yankee can whip me? Are you saying that I'm a coward? And no, like I'm on your guys' side. But the, the reality is the technological advantage is with blue America. And, it only, and, and the technological advantage is in many ways mimetic. And so... Oftentimes, you you have to kind of engage with with blue Americans to understand where they are psychologically. Uh, with, with red Americans, I think red Americans will always understand blue Americans more than the reverse. Red Americans understand blue Americans more than blue Americans do, but but blue Americans can afford to not understand what red Americans think because red Americans won't be able to impose anything on them. Red, red Americans need to have a much better model of the blue mind uh, than they currently do. Uh, they, they need to have the kind of understanding of the blue American mind the way that uh, some Jewish communities had a model of the Gentile mind in the 18th and 19th centuries. They need to know it better than progressives know it themselves. And so they end up just misunderstanding a lot of things that are going on. Uh, right now... It, the, the conversation is not about how can we make Christianity better or how do we come up with a compromise. Right now, Blue America is discussing political possibilities for crushing and ruling Red America and crushing and ruling Christian America insofar as they can pull it off. That's the conversation that they're having right now. And Christian's role in this is to be as hard to smash as possible. To be, you know, to kind of put put on the same kind of front that I that I described with people coming after me for cancellation attempts, lay out the truth, and then say, okay, do you want to have a bite of this fight? And and most of the time they don't because most of the time they're cowards. And, and ultimately, I think Blue America's laziness will be its undoing, and its inability to morally motivate itself will be its undoing. I I can't guarantee that, but that's my instinct. And but but that's the battle we're f fighting. Uh, we're not fighting a battle like uh, how how do we integrate how how do we come to a moderate centrist position on the culture war so that we can all be good Christians in one sense or another. That's just not the conversation, and uh, I think it's mainly geographic the reason for that distinction or reason for that mistake. Cringe Walker for five dollars. Man train wrecks his own marriage. Claims to know how to govern a church. Many such cases. Yeah. 
that's just I, I don't know what to say about Rod Her I really don't. I mean, he was so formative in my own development as a Christian. He was so formative. And I, I loved his early books. Uh, and, and I don't know. I mean, it just, it, you, you, it, he, he, if, if he had a kind of blithe, if it was blithe innocence, then it would be almost tolerable. But I, I don't know how to process Rod Draher, the uh, anti-racism witch hunter. What what good is that? How what what good is Rod Draher, the the rootless cosmopolitan anti racist witch hunter, who is also like a conservative somehow. <laughs> but but he's based in Hungary, guys. Uh, yeah, I don't want to bash Rod Draher anymore. But I just I, I don't know. I I feel like he deserves it. I mean, like he took a a, a person's like what what should have been like a personal disciplinary action. And blew it up to a national scale to basically humiliate a man for I don't know what purpose, what ultimate purpose was the humiliation necessary? Does he deserve to be treated with kid gloves after that? Why, why is Rod Dreher less guilty than Thomas Accord? I guess, uh, did he, I mean, I guess Thomas Accord lied about his indiscretions, he lied about being mean online, he lied about uh, saying unchristian things anonymously online. That's uh, Accord's great sin. Uh, okay, but but if you're so certain that Rod Dreher is just the innocent lamb he is to cast the stone, uh, you're more certain than I am at this stage. And I, I I'm 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 very sure that that Rod Dreher is not above criticism of the kind that I'm laying out right now. Although part of his shtick is to come off like he is not worthy of criticism. Uh, okay, uh, here's the, the Nerve AMV maker for $4. Conquest's fourth law of politics should be that one is always more opposed to someone on their own right uh, than they are to anyone on their left, no matter how far to the left they are from them. I guess, I mean, who's to my right? I mean, I feel like a lot of people are to my right. I feel like Endeavor is to my, I feel like Charlemagne's to my right. And he's like, I'm friends with him, I think. I haven't talked to him in like a year. Or maybe I, I've, I've talked on chat groups with him a lot, but not, not personally. And, uh, uh, you know, like he's to my right and he's my friend. I, I mean, generally, it, it's, it's just, it's easier to punch because of Conquest's first and second law, it's always easier to punch right than it is left. Because history naturally moves to the left, if you punch left, there's a possibility that in 10 years, you'll be punching yourself. And so there's always a suspicion when you look at people on your left that what you are now is what I will become in the future. And because of that, no one wants to punch left. Punching to the right is easy. Because most people, you know, most societies, except in, ter in times of crisis, don't move to the right in any meaningful sense. So that's probably the origin. It, it, I don't know. That fourth law is too situational and too derived from the, uh, the, the, other, the other two to be a, a proper fourth law or a and B maker. You're constructing a dependent axiom, as we say, in the math business. So I think I'll keep I'll keep my laws at three, uh, but I appreciate the sentiment. It is, in in certain circumstances, true. Uh, Sam one five three support for the monologue. Cheers, Dave. Well, thank you very much. Uh, John Lino, Leo Ginned for three dollars USA. To add Nerve and V Maker's question of inspiration by fiction, I can name quite a lot of top and champion boxers and MMA fighters who took up the gloves because of action anime. I thought you were going to say because of Rocky. But yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know action anime. Is that just a genre of anime or is that a title of a specific anime? Uh, I mean, I guess in the world of Otaku no video, it might literally be a title. Anyway, uh, the the uh, the 
the question, uh, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. I guess I, I know people who, for instance, I know people who, who went into sports because of Rocky. That's a great example, right? Uh, yeah, f- people being inspired by fiction happens all the time. And I, I'm kind of blanking on, on something that I, I, I've seen recently where people would do this. I mean, for me personally, uh, this, this is what I've always wanted, is I want people to try to imagine what it would be like to, to, to sort of live as a heroic individual in the modern world as a traditionalist. I feel like Whit Stillman in his movies really gets close to this. If anyone wants to see Cosmo, I think it's Cosmopolitan. I don't want to mix it up with the Woody Allen movie. But Whit Stillman's Cosmopolitan and Damsels in Distress, he's kind of this um, mirror inversion of Woody Allen. It's like the wasp Woody Allen, where he has kind of eccentric characters, but they're all kind of conservative wasps rather than eccentrically progressive uh, Jewish uh, misanthropes like in Woody Allen movies. And, um, and they're always kind of the secret heroes of their societies that are radically not uh, conservative and radically not wasp anymore. So it's, it's sort of like these, these wasps living in rebellion of, of post-wasp America. And, and I want to see, I, I want to see stories, fictional stories even, of, um, of families that are kind of living heroic lives, in, Christian lives, in opposition to post-Christian America. And, and just sort of the, the quiet dignity which they hold themselves. And I know I'm not a very quiet person, but I, I love reading about it, right? I mean, that would be refreshing in my, in my mind. Anyway, I'm going to keep on going on. Uh, the Sink Dweller for, five, for $8 USA. Hello, Dave. How do you become comfortable in your own beliefs, religious and political? When I make a refutation of an argument on a topic, I become unsettled and think maybe I'm just stupid. So, so shut up. Well, you're you're like me with proofs. I, I you know I, I write I've written them a few times for academic papers and and I was I was worried that there's some secret like caveat or counterexample I haven't taken into consideration that's gonna bust the entire thing. And it's gonna be super, super embarrassing. Okay, so um for me, Sink Dweller, um I think a lot of people misunderstand the nature of politics and they misunderstand the nature of, of how people are asked to interface with politics. Uh, the most important thing about your political views is not some derivation or some line of logic that you've started. It's your moral presuppositions. It's your, your moral dedications. It's your loyalty. It's the people, the deities, the divinities, the moral principles that you've dedicated your own life to defending. That's what makes you a political animal in the proper Aristotelian sense. And, and that's, what, that's what defines your people, your polis that needs defending. Everything else is really sort of superfluous. Uh, the, what, 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 what moderns have taught us to do is to to sort of embarrass people. And this is what new atheists did a lot. Is that they would they would they would create these syllogisms and these analogies that were sort of humiliating for progressive for 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 sort of progressive Christians or from Christians from a red state background who are encountering sophisticated ideas for the first time in their twenties in blue areas. And people got humiliated, and they were they were this temporary humiliation was used to dissuade them from principles that were really not that, that they were, were they were axiomatic or should have been considered axiomatic to begin with uh my favorite example of this obviously there's the flying spaghetti monster but is anyone uh, anyone aware of like pictures of jesus that are going around like this is what scientists say the picture of jesus actually looked like and first of all we don't have jesus's body so how would we know what his his face looked like right obviously some kind of Middle Eastern face. And, you know, most actors who portray him in movies and modern movies have a face that would be passable for a Middle Eastern face, maybe a little bit more light skin, but, you know, certainly not off the course. But but the images they always circulate are like, the the, the two images that they have are like an incredibly pissed off, like Arab looking guy. And, and you can tell uh, he, he looks deliberately evil because they make his eyebrows really, really low and close to his eyes. And they give him this weird slipping forehead and this scowl. 
And then the other image they circulate is is this like really dopey looking guy. Like, he has this like dopey looking fat face. And um, you know, and and what and it's what's so funny is that it, it couldn't be racial, right? Because the the images they're, they're both sort of passably Semitic faces, right? But one's really fat, and the other one's really thin. One looks really goofy, and the other one looks really like pissed off and stern. So obviously, in in the range of of Jewish faces from the first century A.D., uh, you could build a picture that looks exactly like the frescoes inside the Hagia Sophia. Uh, but the atheists have chosen the absolute ugliest pictures they could get from their auto-generate uh, Jewish-looking face computer, eigenface generator, and, and just so that they can put it in front of Christians, say, this is science, and get the Christians to be embarrassed because their Messiah looks really, really stupid, as shown to you by science. Um, yeah, again, this is not how arguments work. This is not how political positions work. Develop your moral axioms and then th th and then kind of bring those axioms very blithely to the real world and just apply them. And then 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 when you when you have a, a moral when you have a political position, say, this is the way I think about this. Moral axiom, uh, experience, and then a, a set of syllogisms that process that experience and that moral axiom into a given political position. And I may be wrong, but this is the best I can reason it. And uh, ultimately, you know, I'll, I'll see if there's an error. If there is an error, I'm not going to let it, that error embarrass me to discard my core moral principle. That error exists purely in the argument that I've just made and does not cause me to just kind of flee from the dedications and the people I fight for at a larger level uh, otherwise. So uh, thank you very much, The Sink Dweller. Uh, I'm going to have to keep on going because I'm way behind, way, way, way over time. Medwords for $5 USA. Thanks, Dave. For context, I'm a senior in our philosophy theology honors program. It's been meh. Thankfully, to be on a full tuition scholarship. We had a politics class last year in which we read views ranging from Hobbes to Robert Reich. Well, um... Yeah, uh, Robert Reich. Oof. What a downgrade from Thomas Hobbes. I, I have Thomas Hobbes, and I, I tried to reread him in 2020. I got pretty well good ways into the Leviathan. I remember reading Thomas Hobbes in a philosophy survey class when I was in college, but it must have been a highly abridged version because it certainly wasn't as long as the Leviathan copy I currently have now. So I consider him to be a good source, although I always get the sense that I'm reading like this, uh, you know, the 17th century autist <laughs> talk about politics. You know, it, it sounds like he has a lot of insights, but but they're they're so narrow, right? No, no wonder people thought he was an atheist back when he, he wrote in the 17th century. Dreadnought for ten dollars USA. What do you think happens if something? If something comes out in the next six months or so, which catastrophically blows the narrative, such as if mass numbers of people start dropping dead because of something we were totally not forced to take. Ah, oh, God bless you and yours as always. Um, well, I, I, Dreadnought, I don't think that that's going to happen. I mean, what would, we, we, we do have tons of people dropping dead currently for a mysterious reason. And uh, how how I mean this has been going on for what six months now I believe the, these these high post COVID excess deaths that no one has an explanation for uh, that doesn't seem to be blown lit off the narrative I, I guess if there is a definitive study that came out that showed that COVID remedies were responsible for these excess deaths. Even in part, that would be enormous. That would be uh, the the problem is look. And Morgoth went through this. I highly recommend reading his Substack on this point. Uh, they they can't. They they will never publish a paper that attributes even five percent of the F excess deaths to the COVID vaccine. Uh, because if they do that, if, even if that's true, I really doubt all of the excess deaths are due to this remedy. But but they but they can't publish this 
because if they publish that, uh, they will admit that these 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 World Health Organizations and the CDC just killed like millions of people, <laughs> even at a very small percentage of these excess deaths. It's that big. Uh, that would end the cathedral. Uh, that would end the cathedral. How it, they, they would basically have to just become a dictatorship at that point. Because their ability to control public opinion or the narrative at that stage would be shattered. And uh, what do people, you know, and, and so I think that this will be, this will be suppressed if, it, if it's the case. It, very likely, the truth is complicated. And that's great for them because the complicated truth can always be resolved so that the result will be buried in the history books and not in the front page headlines of, of our iPads or, you know, the New York Times, which we never publish it anyway. Um, but anyway, yeah, I don't know. I mean, these cathedral ending narrative, asymmet the cathedral can also not openly come out and say, hey guys, everyone, uh, there are actually statistical differences in, uh, certain biological profiles of demographic groups. And we've known this for years and this could have an impact on certain, uh, gaps and proclivities of different groups in society. They can't say that. That would end the regime instantly. Uh, and, you know, there have been, there's been strong evidence of that for, you know, decades. Is it is it solved? Is it proved? No. There is still the possibility that it's it's not the case. But they're, 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 they're not going to prove anything about excess deaths either. There'll, there'll be an open controversy. And... And, and a lot of evidence will point in the wrong direction. Uh, but but that, that controversy will be endlessly litigated, endlessly litigated until the controversy is well and truly blown, blown until the, the main political issue, the main political controversy is blown over and they can successfully reintroduce the fact as a historical detail and not as an act of political issue. Uh, Dreadnought, dude, your 40k video was magnificent. You used narrative tropes most of us recognize to essentially give chapter of Proverbs moral and reactionary thought. Not only was I drawn into it, I'm probably going to use it for others. It was great. Well, that's funny because that Warhammer video was <laughs> my, my attempt to essentially create the bare bones minimum piece of crap content I could produce. I guess I put a little bit of time thinking uh, into the into coming up with the lessons, but it was certainly not designed to be like a prominent video on my channel. But I'm very glad you you you, you appreciated it, Dreadnought. I always like it when people tell me they they are going to use uh, something I've created to, for the edification of others. That's why I do this channel, not for the money. Although I you know the the this does really help the Christmas budget. Uh, things just get so expensive. Uh, asteroidal assassin for three dollars usa why do you think immigrants uh why do you think they immigrate so many muslims immigrate so many muslims we as a group are the most aggressively against progressivism it's odd do they hope to corrupt us uh i mean it, it's it's actually a lot less sexy than that or aster, asteroidal assassin it, it's that muslims immigrate to western countries because they have high birth rates and Muslim countries tend to be poorer than progressive countries. And Muslims have Muslims at least plausibly can be brought in as skilled labor uh, and they can fulfill a skilled labor slot that very few say sub-Saharan Africans can fill in their profile. So they tend to be very popular groups to admit under legal immigrant purviews. Uh, and, and so that's why they're that's why they make up a large amount of the immigration rate into Europe specifically. Uh, their voting patterns are more or less coincidental. The only thing the cathedral cares about are that they vote against the cathedral only needs to defeat the the party directly below it. It doesn't worry about Islamic parties developing five rungs down on the political ladder. If there's a Islamic supremacist party or the Taliban create their own political party in France and it pulls 2% of the vote, uh, the cathedral doesn't care. They only care about, they won't care about it until it becomes the contender for power at the highest level. Then they'll care about it. 
Before then, it, it, it won't even register. And until then, all these little Muslim parties do is create a counterbalance against the native factions in their own countries, which are their contemporary political rivals. So that, that's the reason why Muslim immigration is supported by progressives. Uh, almost, like, like Progressives don't care about uh, like gay people. And they care about them if they have those proclivities, if they're elites, but they, they don't care about the ultimate well-being of, of homosexuals. Uh, they, they let aid, I mean, people who know this in, in San Francisco and in other cities, they, they let the AIDS epidemic rage they, and they didn't close the bathhouses for like well into the... Well, well into the, the the AIDS pandemic, they they knew that these that these meetups for gay men were was causing the spread, and they let them go on anyway. These people don't care about uh, they they don't care about black people either. They don't care about the thousands of people who were killed by the excess crime wave or the crime plateau we experienced since George Floyd. Uh, they don't care about the decline of the black family. They they only care that the African American community votes against white America. And, and that's the reason why they're, 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 they're the African American community is a client group, and that's the reason why um, why why they support that why, why there is this this incredibly parasitic relationship. Curtis Windover for three dollars USA. Schenk Unger's response to Yarvin and the cathedral's concept was oddly compelling. Did you see it? Yeah, I watched about five minutes of the Schenk Unger debate and quote unquote i can't put out scare quotes around debate so i'm not going to try in the words of red letter media but yeah it was really cringe i couldn't get through it was it more or less the argument that ben burgess put forward that the, the real cathedral is like elon musk and mark zuckerberg and oil tycoons uh you know i don't know i i don't find that counter argument very very i don't find the counter argument very compelling uh, the, the narrative control and the control over ideas and the control over the actions of the government that oil tycoons have is very minimal, as far as I can tell. The influence of a small group of Jewish intellectuals who went to NYU in the 1960s probably had more of a bearing on us invading Iraq than the entire fossil fuel industry the world over. People said it was a war over oil. It was not. It was a war because the Pentagon and neoconservative intellectuals wanted to go to war to prove a point and to gain political power over the State Department, which they ended up losing. But yeah, I, I, I can't agree with you on that one. Um, Asteroid Will Assassin for $3 USA. What are your thoughts on D&D &D alignments? Uh, I, I don't like the nine alignment system. It, I agree it's kind of silly. I... I I, I don't think that the D&D alignment system is a very good personality. I mean, there's two things you want to know about your character, right? If you were to create a character, there's two things you want to know about them. The first thing you want to know is you want to know like their core religion, their core moral compass. And then, then you want to know, um, uh, then you want to know their, uh, their, their personality type. The, the problem is, is that the D&D &D system, uh, its alignment is a combination of both personality type and core moral religion. And they use the same word for both, which is, uh, you know, chaotic, uh, good, lawful, neutral, or chaotic, right? And I think there, there is a case that order versus chaos is the fundamental moral religious persuasion that all humans have in, in their heart of hearts. And... And so, you know, you could create an alignment that way. But I think order and chaotic personality, like, that's a very poor describer of personality. And so I think that the, the, the nine the, the nine box D&D alignment system is a little too clever by half. It, it's trying to make Cartesian something that's fundamentally just two questions that shouldn't be graphed on the same axes. And uh, that, that's why you get to a lot of deceptive stuff. Um. Uh, last things. Oh, hey, man, I have not yet listened to your Alex Kashuda interview. I am looking forward to that, though. It's on her channel. Everyone check it out. Last things for $15 USA. 
A common opinion on the dissident right is that the leading cause of mental illness is kids being sent to daycare. What are your thoughts? I am an elder millennial and my parents put me in daycare and I don't have depression and gender dysphoria. I don't like it, but I don't think it's the uh, root of all evil. Yeah, I don't think daycare is the root of all evil. I mean, I don't live around families, so, you know, having professional people watch my kid is... We couldn't do anything if I didn't have professionals uh, to, to watch my son uh, periodically. I think that some of, like, the, the daycare systems oftentimes are leaned on a little bit too hard by parents, and it really should be more... Um, you know, family members that that take that role, but uh, people move around too much, and it's 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 a situation. We have to be a little bit forgiving of ourselves. I don't think that the main problem with uh, mental illness is is early childhood education. The leading cause of mental illness is screen time, exercise, and very very bad progressive education. At, at at the later childhood and at the at, at the adolescent and college age level, uh, and, and the general lack of community that's what's causing depression. Isolation is causing depression. So yeah, I I, I, I kind of am I'm not pro daycare, but I'm pro understanding daycare as as a an all of the above option. Uh. Creeper weirdo for um, $3 USA. Why is it some people on the distant right still spread the BS that the right can't create compelling art? It's an uphill battle for sure, but it's possible. We need to encourage each other. Yeah, I'm, I, I totally agree. I mean, I'm, you know, the Endeavor and Gifts Ungiven had a collaborative short story that came out last month and it was really, really good. Everyone should check that out. It's on Endeavor's channel. I tend to be one who likes reading fiction rather than listening to it. I love listening to nonfiction, but fiction I always want to have on the written page. But it's still really good. Everyone check it out. Uh, I think the right wing can create art. The problem is, is that we just don't have a big enough slice of the creative class at this stage. So... Pound for pound, we're always going to be creating less art, which means that we're going to be creating worse art because art is mainly a matter of practice and mainly a matter of of cultivating uh, certain talents. And the more spins of the roulette wheel you get, both in terms of finding people with raw biological talent and in terms of giving them enough shots to create something that's truly compelling, uh, the more great art you're going to get. I am way, way, way over time. Um, Darth Calhoun for $3 USA. It was my grandmother's 77th birthday today, so I'm late for the stream. I'll rewatch tomorrow at work. Well, thank you very much. Iron Duke for er, for five dollars. Green River lied about Don the Pleb. AA should not be anti uh, anti Don the Pleb. Dave, you were one of the few who did not lie and stood by, uh, and stood as a man. Well, thank you very much. I have good opinions of Don the Pleb. Um, I think we see the world in very different ways. Obviously, I'm a blue stater, although I think we come from the same state. Uh, I think we come from different ends of it. Um. I don't know. I think people should just bury the hatchet about this stuff. And I, I look, I, I'm unaware of any substantive reason why academic agent and Don the Pleb should be at each other's throats. It's just, it's, it's, an, it's a stupid um, conflict in my opinion, but it's um, not something that I can really relitigate. It, I don't think it would be fair for me to relitigate that. Uh, first of all, I don't want to relitigate internet drama. Uh, and um, I certainly don't want to relitigate it at almost one o'clock at night here. But here is my last super chat. Thank, uh, thank the heavens that they are done. <laughs> Alternative Avenue for five dollars USA. Thanks for everything you do. Is the food better on the West Coast or the East Coast? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I have to say, like, the top foodie locations I've ever been to 
Portland, Berkeley, and New York. I just never had a bad dining experience in those locations. Uh, and I've been unimpressed with San Francisco, but for some, every time I've gone to New York, the food has been atrociously expensive and then absolutely delicious. Every single time I've gone, I've been impressed with the quality. Uh, and uh, Berkeley's got some really nice foodie venues and Portland's famous for it as well. And so, so all that stuff is really nice. I, I've only been in the East Coast for a short period of time, but I don't know. I'll give it to the East Coast just because New York has been a really good experience for me, culin <laughs> culinarily speaking, not in other regards. But anyway, we are done with the Super Chats, and I am not going to dilly-dally at all because I am very, very, very over time. And we're going to get on to reading the Psalm of the Night, which is Psalm 124. Uh, so this is, If the Lord has not been on our side, this is Israel's song. If the Lord has not been on our side when men rose against us, then would they have swallowed us alive when their anger was kindled? Then would the waters have engulfed us, the torrent gone over us, over our head would have swept the raging waters? Blessed be the Lord, who did not give us a prey, uh, a prey to their teeth. Our life like a bird has escaped from the snare of the fowler. Indeed, the snare has been broken and we have escaped. Our help is the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Thank you guys very much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week and uh, a good night. I hope everyone had a, thank a good Thanksgiving and I'll see you next Tuesday for a another podcast broadcast from Fiddler's Screen. Have an excellent night. Good evening.